seeing the presence of a quorum, I'm going to call the order of this uh, meeting of the Amherst Pollen Regional School Committee. Uh, as a note, this uh, meeting is being uh, recorded for future broadcast on Amherst Media and availability online. Uh, the first item in business, we have, we have some, uh, some fun and, and important business to get to in a second, but before we do, uh, the first order of business is approving the minutes of June 26th and August 15th, 2018. I don't know if the committee's had opportunity to look at those minutes and have any corrections. Yes, is it on this? Uh, just two minor corrections. So one uh, under the first um, June 26th minutes, item number one, I actually came in just a few minutes after the executive session had been called. Okay. And so if, number two, it says that I seconded the motion to approve. <laughs> Okay. But I just want to make sure that it somehow reflects and I came oh. in a little bit late. Um, okay. And then the, well, this one not there yet, the August 15th minutes. You can bring it up. You know. Okay. Yeah, okay. Um, so <coughs> my name is listed as Anastasia Morton in August. <laughs> There's been a lot of confusion on that, so I'm not sure. Anastasia, I can't oh. that. Well, go figure. <laughs> Uh, are there other are there edits? I'll take a motion. I guess we'll do it uh, sequentially. I'll take a motion to approve the meeting minutes of June 26, 2018. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Move and second. Do the post vote. I'm just noticing the absence of microphones. Yeah, right. No, exactly. There's an absence of microphones, and we're being recorded by that little camera no. over there. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's just we have to speak up. Uh, good point. Hey, do I have a second on the minutes? Or? I think Kara. Oh, you did? Okay, thanks. <laughs> I got, so I get distracted. I apologize. Uh, okay, any further discussion on the meeting minutes of June 25th? Seeing none, all those in favor of approving the minutes as amended, raise your hand. It carries unanimously. Uh, now on to August 15th, 2018. Do you have a motion to approve those minutes? So moved. So moved. Is there a second? Second. So moved and second. Any uh, comments or notes on this? Other than Morton versus Hodemius. <laughs> <laughs> Seeing none, all those in favor of approving those minutes uh, as amended, raise your hand, signify an aye. Carries unanimously again. Uh, <coughs> cool, now onto the fun stuff. Um, one, you know, in, in my history in, uh, in the town of Amherst, in my opinion, one of the uh, best um, civic and academic programs I know of is a better chance. Um, uh, I actually lived up the street uh, for a while. On, not that anyone cares, by the way, but I did <laughs> live up the street on, uh, on North Prospect Street for a while from the ABC house. And so for that reason, both through school activities and um, walking home, just hanging out with uh, the kids who were there, I had a chance to get to know that program well as through a number of ABC walks and just thought it's one of, it seemed that in my mind, it's something that had been around forever and been uh, an extraordinary valuable uh, program for our community and for our schools, but as it turns out, it hasn't been around forever. Um, and we're, we're celebrating this year the 50th uh, anniversary of this of this program, being a part of our community, and then of course that means uh, generations of students being part of our community and contributing to the, the richness of our academic and social environment. So it's a wonderful thing, and uh, we thought it was a great moment to take the time to uh, acknowledge, celebrate, appreciate, and recommit ourselves uh, to that relationship <coughs> as, a, as a school district and as a school community. Uh, so so I just to say, that normally our ritual is we talk about something in one meeting, and then we vote about another meeting. And um, with the uh, permission of the committee, we would love it if we could both talk about it and vote about it and celebrate it uh, in one meeting. And if there's disagreement of that, like everything, we work democratically, <laughs> and if you don't like that idea, uh, then you'll have to come back in October. Um, but with your discretion, I would like now to, to turn this over to the superintendent, who will then further, I think, have uh, a discussion by Principal Jackson, as well as also the president of the ABC board, uh, Ms. Kohler. Yes, I just want to thank uh, Ms. Kohler and others who informed me about this being the 50th anniversary. and. Um, one of the neat things I was able to do was we're fortunate to have the Jones Library and they have the special collections. Mm -hmm. And I called someone I knew at special collections and I said, you know, I'd really love to know more about the history. <coughs> I've done the ABC Walk, I've been connected to the program, but I wasn't 
frankly, alive when it started. I'm not <laughs> of that age yet. Um, and so uh, I went to Special Collections and found a tremendous, I mean, within half an hour, she said, oh, come on up. I've got a treasure trove. Got to put on the special gloves to take the pictures because they were original pictures from uh, the late 1960s and early 1970s. I want to thank Debbie Moreland for putting together this slideshow. Uh, we picked some of the, the some highlights um, uh, from the scholars uh, from years past. But one of the most interesting things too was reading, I think it was the old Amherst Record before there was the Amherst Bulletin, articles about um, some of the debate and discussion in the town when uh, they, were, they were talking about the ABC house um, and, and the program getting started. It was, I believe, a third public school program that was started. And, and so much of the discussion was on the impact on the students. And what I hear and experience in the district is the benefits of the students bringing to the school. And I think that's an important shift for people to recognize that 1968, the focus was, was not really on the benefits of school. And when we have this conversation right now, uh, that's the focus of what the students bring and how they enrich the experience of our high school and our schooling experience for all students. Um, so we really thank all of you who are students uh, and those of you who continue to work and make the program vibrant. Uh, we had some good conversations about how to stay connected and maybe enhance the connections, not just for the, the scholars, but actually for the program and some of the ABC walk and enhance our connections at a district level to the great work that's happening. Um, and I really thank everybody for, for being here tonight and coming to uh, this celebration. I could go on and on about old Amherst record articles and, and pictures, but I'll uh, turn it to Mark Jackson, the high school principal, who's going to share a couple things and then introduce Ms. Kohler. Should I still come up here? Or can I Please come up here because then the camera can get up. Um, so actually, my role is a fairly limited one. Um, what happens is that Wendy and Sid and Isabel, they recruit students from around the Eastern Seaboard, and they bring them to, for a weekend to the high school. And I always have a meeting with them. And this, so parents, guardians are in the room along with the, along with the students. And my really focus is on the family because this is a big decision for the family to bring their, uh, send their child off away at the tender age of 13 or 14. And so I, I got myself in the rhythm where I say that when people came to see me 15 years ago, I knew nothing about ABC and I was just kind of reading off the cheat sheet underneath the table, right? I didn't have any first-hand experience as a basis to sell the program to these uh, uh, legitimately skeptical or suspicious parents. But today, I'm in a position to tell a very different story, right? And I look the parents in their eye and I say, the best thing I can say to you is that I have first-hand experience, 15 years worth of experience that the program works. And what I mean by that, just about everybody, and I think there's probably been only two exceptions over the years, just about everybody who comes in, um, goes to class, gets involved in activities, enriches the school, and at the back end, they walk away with an MS Regional High School diploma and they get on to a four-year college in the rest of their lives. I've watched it, I've seen it with kids from all up and down the East Coast from all manner of backgrounds. The program works. And that's my contribution, right? That this is, this is an unadulterated good. This is something that's made a material difference in both the lives of the school, but most importantly, <laughs> in the lives of the kids at home. So I'm very happy that we're here tonight acknowledging one of the signature features of what the town has accomplished. Thanks. Ms. Kohler. Mr. Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> uh, is this okay? If you can step up, to, uh, just to get captured on the camera, I hate to say it, so you're not a disembodied <laughs> <laughs> voice. <laughs> So thank you very much. Before I just make a, a few remarks, I want to um, recognize um, some of the people uh, of the ABC community who've joined us tonight. First and foremost, Sid and Isabel Ferreira are resident directors. Um, we have current and former board members present, well, at least back here, um, Keith Nesbitt, who's actually president-elect, Meg Hart, uh, treasurer Kirsten Hullibird, who's very important, our walk-run coordinator. Um, and I, I know there are other supporters in the room, but I would like each of our scholars to take a moment, if it's okay with the committee, to introduce themselves. Starting with you, Pierre. How are you? I'm Pierre Tillis. I'm a junior. Um, I grew up in Bridgeport, Connecticut. I'm just, <laughs> just, just got off the football field. <laughs> uh, Yo, <laughs> uh, good evening. My name is Matt Itzendel. 
I am also from Bridgeport, Connecticut. And yeah. <laughs> sophomore. sophomore. Oh, I'm a sophomore too. <laughs> Hi, my name is Daniel Molina. I am a sophomore and I am from North New Jersey. Um, ABC. <laughs> uh, really enjoy ABC. I enjoy the opportunities and the Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Azamir. I'm a freshman. I'm from Canaan, Vancouver. My name is Rashawn Jacobs. I'm a junior. I'm from Patterson, New Jersey. Okay, thank you guys. Um, these young men are scholars, obviously represent themselves, uh, the program, and the proud tradition of um, the program and the scholars that you see on the screen. Uh, of course, you know this is a community commitment, um, and but and that takes the full community. But at the core of it is the partnership with the regional schools and particularly the high school. I want to particularly acknowledge Mark and I know Mary and Mary Custard, Liz, um, everybody who's part of the staff here has given so much for so long and continues to promise to do so. Um, and without that. And we wouldn't have a program. Without the support of the Regional School Committee, there would be no Amherst a Better Chance. So as we um, celebrate this year, um, we, we are planning, besides the walk-run, pitch-pitch, you can pick up information about that in the back, <laughs> and the gala at the end of the, of the year, um, there's going to be a community gospel choir concert again that brings music of the community and different um, generations um, and and you know, people and, and groups from the community together. Um, we want to acknowledge the partnership that has been so important um, with Amherst College <coughs> for all these years providing tutorial support. But I would say first and foremost, we want to acknowledge <coughs> the partnership with the schools. And we have some thoughts about how to do that, but we really want the school committee to know in particular how much we value and appreciate and understand um, not only the financial support, which is obviously extraordinary, but, and the academic and the extracurricular support and the leadership and the love and, and guidance, but that this is truly a partnership. Mark is always very good at pointing out, um, as Mike just said tonight too, that we, we get as much as we give, if not more. I certainly can speak to that personally. I know all the adults here um, who've had the experience of working with these young men feel the same way. And thanks to you, we can look to the next 50 years. And I think um, I could just end by saying we certainly know that this crossing communities, bringing people together, learning from each other, and sharing is the future of our country, the better chance we all deserve. And thank you very much. Thank you. So I'll entertain a motion. Oh, sorry, I guess should we read this thing? Yeah. Probably read it. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to read it? Sure. A resolution in support of the Amherst Regional High School and Amherst A Better Chance Partnership. Whereas the Amherst Pelham Regional School Committee voted on January 8, 1968 to approve a partnership between Amherst Regional High School and the newly proposed Amer Amherst A Better Chance program. Whereas the first eight A Better Chance scholars enrolled at Amherst Regional High School in the 1968-1969 school year. Whereas more than 120 A Better Chance scholars have graduated from Amherst Regional High School in the ensuing 50 years. Whereas these scholars are highly valued members of the Amherst Regional High School student body who have enriched the Amherst Regional High School and the broader communities through their numerous contributions. Therefore, be it resolved that the Amherst Pelham Regional School Committee reaffirms the continuing commitment to and partnership with Amherst A Better Chance. Is there a motion to approve the uh, proclamation? Moved. Move to approve the resolution as read by Ms. Kosinski. Ms. Ardonius, is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. Dunlap. Is there further discussion on the uh, item? Could be even saying you disagree with it and you're excited about it. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with it, and I'm excited about it. <laughs> <laughs> it's a wonderful thing. But how many opportunities do we have just to affirm this like outpouring of love and support? It's fantastic. It's true. Is it 
Well, I just want to give a special shout out to um, the young man from Newark, New Jersey, where I spent my teenage years as well. <laughs> it's just great to, to have you know fellow Norker here in <laughs> Newark, not Newark, right? And <laughs> So yes, I just wanted to say thank you so much for this program. It's it's fantastic to learn more about it, um, and to have the opportunity to support yet another fifty years. It's a question which may have an obvious answer: Is it an all men's program? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, there are uh, there are women's programs as well, um, and actually, about at, soon after this program was established, one was established in South Hadley for for young women. Um, a lot of the community-based programs struggle uh, financially. Um, actually, we all do, um, mm -hmm. because we get no support from ABC National. So it is actually the funding that comes from this community that keeps this program going. So um, we're happy to say that we're thriving, but we, we know of others that haven't. And um, six to eight young men is probably where we mm -hmm. should stop. <laughs> COVID yes. program would have its own, you know, <laughs> it's for elsewhere. <laughs> well, I, I hope um, you keep them prized as well as engage the committee in any future celebrations you're doing over Absolutely. the course of the year. I think, I'm think i sure the committee would love to participate. Um, I'm not from Newark, but I actually am a native New Jerseyan myself from Northern New Jersey, so <laughs> some sort of New Jersey Amherst connection, which is very positive. We will give you each your very own Save the Date cards for the gala. I think that, I mean, that'd, be, that'd be wonderful. I mean, also, and I don't know if you're going to get alumni up, but um, yes. mm -hmm. with Judy Brooks's service, uh, there were there were ABC yes. alumni up, including some people there, from my generation. Mm -hmm. They're very much looking forward to coming Wonderful. Back. Absolutely wonderful. Any further comments? I'll just... I'll just yeah. say thank you to the program because I was a student here as well and I have mm -hmm. fond memories of the students that were here on the ABC. Mm -hmm. and, um, if I could and just say I'm glad that you and Eric brought, brought that up and um, we hear over and over and there's a, you know, talk about the alums from the program coming back to celebrate but many, you know, there are wedding announcements with ushers named who, you know, and um, uh, baseball, fantasy baseball teams that have, were established when young men who are in the eighth grade and they give their money to ABC when they earn it. So, you know, there's just so many ways that uh, lives have intersected and been touched and, and made better. So, girls too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> just very briefly, it's going to scroll through yeah. it's on that, but just because um, you mentioned Judy Brooks, yeah. one of the favorite pictures I found, and people may or may not have seen it, is mm -hmm. just um, Judy and Barry and Barry Jr. Um, many years ago um, as being sort of directly connected and supportive and kind of the heart of the program at its inception. Mm -hmm. I just want to publicly acknowledge that and then Ms. Brooks is passing um, as we I don't want to put a sad note on this, but for me it's a celebra celebratory is that even, yeah. is that even, I mean, in terms of her legacy, it's not even sad. Yeah. I mean, I remember it was her and Barry that got me involved in the ABC Walks first. Mm -hmm. And you don't, I mean, not that I would have, but you don't say no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's like she inspires you and she lifts you up, exactly. right? Yeah. I mean, it's a wonderful legacy. Yeah. Uh, anything for All the, because also we got to sign this and then we need to let them on their way. Because it's actually, there's, we, each, each of us gets to sign this thing. Uh, anything further? Seeing none, all those in favor, raise your hand signifying aye. It carries unanimously. Let pass these down. Do you, have a, a of do, you, do you need a pen? Can we use separate pen? Yeah. I think you can. Find your, there's, there are duplicates, so just sign each of them. And, and it's and study you. hour time, so oh, is it? I'll yeah. wait for the part <laughs> okay. And I'd like to thank everybody. No. Thank, thank you for coming. coming. Thank you. Sadly, we need to move on. It's the nature of the business. Uh, announcements and public comment. Uh, are there any announcements in the community? Uh, two brief announcements. So one, uh, right across the hallway, there is a presentation on fueling and vaping and practical information that parents and caregivers uh, can learn about this relatively new um, public health issue mm -hmm. uh, with our students. Um, and. On a related note, slightly longer comment, um, on the topic of high potency, easily concealable 
uh, drugs. Um, I went to a uh, community outreach meeting last night for one of the uh, recreational marijuana shops uh, being uh, proposed for Amherst. Um, there's about a half a dozen of these. This is this one was particularly interesting to me because it's, it's right in the heart of downtown. It's uh, 37, 39 Boltwood Walk, uh, which is, you know, Bank Center, Bueno, uh, parking lot area. Um, and um, it was, it's, so this is the mandatory community outreach meeting. I bring it up because we've spoken about yeah, this uh, on committee before. It was, it was very sparsely attended, uh, other than myself, a uh, select board member, and some town uh, employees. There were maybe two or three members of the public. Um, it, the, uh, so the operator seemed nice. Um, I shared my concern, my generalized concern, which was, um, and we, we've heard this spoken before from some of our administrators, which is, you know, does the town want to welcome and promote easy access to this kind of a product? Um, which, which is high potency, easily concealable, um, in the same area, same locations where the town welcomes and encourages children to congregate. And from our perspective, we're talking about middle school and high school students going downtown, being independent. Um, it's, this is one of the reasons why there's zoning bylaws, and if you look at the zoning map of downtown, it's almost completely covered because the Jones creates a buffer zone, the churches create a buffer zone, and there's this little splotch that is just out of the reach of the buffer zone, and that's where this location is. Um, so I was offering the point of view that it's, it's kind of not in the spirit of those laws. So in terms of process, if the committee wanted to take this up as an agenda item to discuss to whatever end, um, that's the sort of main possibility of public input was yesterday. From this point, um, the town goes back, does some further analysis, um, makes a recommendation to the town manager. The town manager then will either approve or not. And at that point, it's relatively finished unless there's a zoning board of appeals mm -hmm. um, outlay. So uh, the opportunity for the committee, I think, is to, if we wanted to provide input, would be to provide it to the town manager uh, and uh, go from there. So it's of interest to uh, put on a future agenda. We can't debate it, so we're right. not going to discuss it. So <laughs> that's a, 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 a long announcement. Yes. <laughs> Any further announcements from the committee? Yes, Ms. Hernandez. Uh, just a quick one. I actually attended the Collaborative for Educational Services uh, meeting last night, which was a great meeting. Um, <clears throat> there's a few new members from some of our other uh, districts, and they've recently updated uh, their course offerings, and I think the superintendent's probably been aware of that. Um, but for the, the school committee members, if you'd like to see more, uh, you can either come to me or you can actually go to their website, also the collaborative.org, that provides a lot of information. There's things there, but, you know, professional development courses, uh, there's, uh, you know, special education courses, there's a lot of different offerings for, you know, uh, districts across the, the area that they serve. So just very quick a little announcement about that. Great, thank you very much. Uh, any further announcements, seeing no further announcements. Um, public comments. Um, you, there are comments from the public. Um, I guess there's no microphone to come forward to, so just come forward generally uh, to the, approach the committee. Identify yourself. Uh, you'll have three minutes for your comment. I don't think we have our little clock that we had before. Um, which I wish we did. But yeah, I can bring it up. Okay, we'll see if we have any comments. Yes, sir. If you have a, pub a comment about an agenda item, should we wait till the agenda comes up? Absolutely not. You should come forward now. Because we didn't organize okay. ourselves to have public comment within the agenda. Okay. So the time to speak would be now. I recognize that's challenging sometimes if you'd prefer to have heard it and have some back and yeah, forth in it. Fine. So I apologize for that. No problem. Um, uh, I, guess we're, I guess we're ready. All right, you got a spot here. Super <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Are you good? Uh, thanks. My okay. name is Nate Buddington. I'm a parent of a recent graduate who's a sophomore in college and a junior uh, in the high school. I think you have a letter from me that I had written to the committee about requesting an audit, a professional audit of handicap accessibility for uh, the Amherst school system. Um, I entered into this world not voluntarily in 2015. Uh, February day, my daughter suffered a pretty severe autoimmune attack at the middle school, and within a couple of hours, she was a paraplegic. And um, so there's this whole world that my wife and I and my daughter are now a part of. Um, the schools have been remarkably supportive in many, many ways. Um, I think I mentioned in the letter that the 
return to school plan that was designed by Mary O'Brien, the nurse, the middle school, and Ron Bahanowitz, the people at Spalding Rehab Hospital said it was the best they've ever seen. And continuing up until now from the superintendent to both principals, guidance office, to peers, to teachers, just tremendous support that we're very grateful for. And it's had a big impact on my daughter's development. She's, she's in good shape emotionally and physically as much as she can be. Um, and some of that has come from the good support we've had from the schools. The, the trick is um, the degree to which I think uh, accessibility is not folded into the sort of social justice paradigm at the school in the way that I think it should be. And there's physical manifestations for that. There's things that are really inaccessible to um, kids who are handicapped that kind of should have been fixed a long time ago. Um, uh, the steps to the gymnasium, um, we made a request a couple of years ago to have a lift put in there. It was just installed a couple of weeks ago, ready to go a couple of weeks ago. The stage is inaccessible. Um, other things that um, I noted in my letter. Um, so really, I think what we're asking for is certainly an audit um, so that we know what we're up against. What are, the, what are the problems that we have in these buildings with access? We're probably never going to be able to bring these buildings to ADA standards. Some of these things may be just cost prohibitive, but we don't even know what the issues are. And I think that's what's been clear to me. Um, Ron Bahanowitz was a great ally for us, and I think he was embarrassed by parts of the school that were inaccessible. Um, and he was just completely on top of things. And his departure, we noticed that. We've been very thankful for, for Ron's presence in, in our life for the, for the last few years. So just to do an audit so we know what we're up against, so as monies become available, as grants may become available, um, maybe we can knock some of these things off to make this school more friendly and more inclusive, which is different than accessible, for kids, teachers, parents who are mobility challenged. And also to think about ways in terms of just kind of the, the consciousness of how we operate as a community in the schools to figure out how we're going to place accessibility and inclusion for the handicapped within the social justice paradigm. So thanks for considering that. I appreciate it. And as a reminder, this is, a, this is an item that's on our agenda later on for discussion. And we'll have that discussion. Are there further um, public comments? Seeing none, we'll close the public comment period. Uh, do we have any super, uh, subcommittee updates? I guess we kind of got one from the representative of the Club of Education School uh, Services. Uh, anything else? Seeing nothing else, we'll move on. Uh, superintendent's update. So I want to start by saying I want to appreciate that the agenda, you got two copies of the agenda, um, and that's, I'm not feeling well, and so I'm going to, my goal is to make it to part D of the meeting, and we'll see how that goes, but um, the reason for the change is the topics beyond part D under new and continuing business, there's other staff members who can facilitate those sections, so. Although I suppose that means if there's, if, there, if you're trying to shoehorn any questions for the superintendent, <laughs> the superintendent's update is the right time to say, this reminds me of a related topic. Can you answer this question? Um, do it now because he's going to disappear soon. That is true. Um, and so I'm just going to highlight uh, a couple of these. Uh, I apologize some of the Amherst members heard these, and, um, but I think it's still worthy for the regional members to hear some of those updates as well. And, and one that was not on here was kind of in the as well. Um, we had a really nice convocation for um, all staff, and thanks to Mr. Makima for making comments on behalf of the committee, and our first staff celebration, while hot, was very well attended. Um, there were 954 slices of pizza donated by area businesses, and all of them were eaten uh, by the end of the evening, so I like having some markers that way. Um, our lot of cabinet, um, which we've talked about at this committee the last couple of years, organized a kickoff event for all Alana staff members, particularly looking at staff members who are new to the district. Um, it's a really successful welcome event. Um, she was here, but Ms. Georgia Malcolm, uh, the staff member, was central in organizing that, so I'll mention her name regardless, uh, along with others. Uh, we're going to talk about ADA building audit later, so I'm going to skip this part because I'll, I'll describe it in, in a much greater detail in a couple minutes. Our open house schedule, so at the middle school, the open house is happening right now, um, and for the high school, uh, it's October 11th, uh, right after the day school. Um, Jessica Manahan, uh, 
uh, who was an author, she was here last year to work with staff, and then she um, did a lot of work both with Summit Academy uh, right at the beginning of the school year, and then the high school and middle school as well. Um, she's an expert on anxiety and how it manifests in students, and how it manifests very differently in different students. And so we had a family event, a uh, parent guardian event with more than 80 attendees. I want to thank CPAC and um, our SSO office for putting that on. The feedback was very positive. Uh, we had a RIAC, Relational and Balance Advisory Committee, that um, I serve on um, at the DESI Committee. So they met um, Monday. Um, and the type, the topics are listed uh, below that we talked about, but Ms. Cunningham was able to um, come into the meeting with Ms. Solomon, who you signed a letter of support last year for the Amherst Futures Program, which Ms. Cunningham will talk a little bit, to talk about what we're doing in Amherst as well as in the area of um, increasing the percentage of staff of color within our schools. And we've all received an, a really good top, uh, topic of conversation for that group. I'll skip social media so I can turn to Ms. Cunningham uh, for the district-wide updates, and then I'll provide some regional-specific updates. Okay. So um, Saturday, this past Saturday, the 22nd, we had our first summit for the Paradigm Shift, which is the partnership program for Amherst and the Diverse Teacher Workshop with five colleges. We have uh, currently four paras who are attending the program and have enrolled at Mount Holyoke. And in this summit, we had a uh, higher ed institutions. We had our partner schools such as Holyoke schools and Springfield schools. And what we looked at was what can we, whether as a district or as an institution, do to support our parents who are looking to become teachers? And what do we currently do that may hinder them from getting, um, moving on to those roles? So it was well attended. We had about almost 70 people. Um, from, like I said, higher ed and from all the school districts, parents, teachers, district uh, administrators, all of them. So it was a great program, and we look forward to having our second summit in the early part of next year, where we'll also talk to principals and, and work with them on how to hire and minimize the implicit bias that they have in their hiring. Move on to regional updates. Um, Summit Academy. So, uh, both Ms. Cunningham and I have spent quite a bit of time over at Summit Academy, um, uh, making sure the students were well situated uh, at the beginning of the school year. Um, and many thanks to our facilities team and for the staff at Summit uh, for getting that ball rolling very well. And the space looks great. Um, it really um, it's very welcoming. And I think Mr. McPherson's plans of, of the right amount of. Uh, its own school, own identity, but also having the flexibility for when, when students or staff members want to be connected to the high school. Um, and the, if you remember all the way back when we looked at floor plans up on the screen, there was, um, there's an exterior sort of shed off that, and it existed before this move, uh, but we're working on scheduling its removal, um, uh, which will help also in terms of outdoor access um, as well. Um, just in, uh, we talked a little bit about this, I think, at the end of the year, but, um, oh, I'm skipping. So let me stick with the second one. Um, so at the end of the fiscal year, the state ended with a $1 billion roughly surplus. The governor filed a supplemental budget to how that money should be spent. Some was put into, was intended to be put into the rainy day fund. I don't have a technical term for that. Maybe the second year it is. So rainy day fund. All right, mm -hmm. rainy day fund. Um, but there was a significant amount of funds that were put into education, both in terms of school safety, um, school safety broadly, so it's not just about school resource officers or something like that that many schools have, but uh, mental health professionals. Uh, it was also uh, an increase to regional transportation and special ed circuit breaker. Um, and the governors filed that, and um, there has not been action taken by the legislature. And so it um, just is one of these things hanging out there that we don't know if that money's coming in or not, and particularly at the regional level, because of, um, as opposed to the, the other elementary districts, regional transportation for sure, but Circuit Breaker is a much larger, has a much larger impact on the regional schools than it does at the elementary level. This is, this is no small amount of change um, that's at stake, so um, I, I think I'll leave it to other members who may want to talk about <coughs> advocacy at some point, but um, right now there's a lot of uncertainty of where that sits. Um, uh, a couple weeks ago, the High School Community Day, so this is something that was started a couple of years ago uh, in an effort to bring students together and to start the school year in a way where students um, are connecting with their peers and staff members in ways to build community within the school. Um, talk about the school norms, which you can see there below, but 
the activities include fun things like dunk tank. Mr. Jackson's a very good sport about that, um, and games um, to really um, get out of the academic mindset that is, you know, our high school has, like many high schools, and really to remind ourselves about the human aspect that we have, you know, roughly 1,100 people spending most of their day in one site, and we should build those human connections. It's highly successful. Luckily, the weather um, worked out well for us. Uh, we did receive about $20,000 of emergency impact aid for displaced students, mostly in our case from Puerto Rico, not exclusively, but mostly from Puerto Rico, based on the hurricanes from last year from the federal government. Previously, we talked about the funds that were um, slated to come from the state government on that. Um, and lastly, um, just wanted to share some of the key work that um, you know, work streams for this year. Certainly, as we talked about last year, there was a capital item of the master planning study and looking forward uh, on that so we know how bids in and we're in a process of uh, getting towards being able to select um, someone to help us think about what are we doing with our spaces at the secondary level. Uh, similarly, we'll be focusing on the math curriculum and instruction program review and looking for some external folks to help us think about that and take a look at what we're doing 7 through 12, really 6 through 12, because our math curriculum is a 6 through 8 math curriculum. Um, so more on that coming, and when we look at the future agenda items, you can see that these things are all slotted. Uh, um, another one's the support of students' well-being, and that maybe sounds general, um, but for us it's really not, that the implications of how to approach well-being are, mul are many, but they all have the same focus. So things that we are all um, thinking about is what we hear. So we heard about anxiety about kids, like I talked about earlier, that, that's one response. Uh, some of the vaping, right, so what's happening the other side of the, the hall right now, uh, that's another response. But you know, we consistently get continue to gather feedback about start time, right? And you know, how can that be thought about? So we're really taking a holistic look at well-being, and that's going to be something that we'll continue to talk about throughout the year. Um, the strategic planning process, which we'll talk about later tonight, um, and then and invariably budgets and assessments will be a topic that comes up throughout this year. Um, and we can get slotted that multiple times as we look at the draft agendas coming up. So I thought it was just worthwhile to share, you know, we're obviously doing more than these things, but in terms of where the workflows are and work streams, this is where a lot of our attention is at it. Any questions for the I just have a comment on, uh, as far as the um, support of students' well-being. I've heard from three or four Shrewsbury parents who are concerned that their children or their students will not use the bathrooms because of the fear of being tapped for vaping or jeweling and they're just they're not going to the bathroom all day well thank you that's the first i'm hearing of that but um we we're trying to set up a meeting anyway so uh, i'd love to hear more about that okay. and share that with mr jackson thank you yeah Are there are questions for the superintendent before the, this item is closed seeing none uh there's no real change report I think the thing, the thing for me, actually, the last the last item on the superintendent's update was one of the things that Mike and I talked about, is that we want, I mean, and this follows on from the retreat, is trying to organize things and organize our conversation in ways that both are strategic, but also the work of our committee month to month and meeting to meeting. Um, we can see what the roadmap is and where we're going from September to December and uh, March, because uh, it'll sneak up on us before we know it. We're going to be in the middle of regional assessment and budget conversations and then seemingly everything else gets obliterated by that. And then anything else that we cared about is, I mean, you'll still be doing your work, the team will be doing your work, staff will be doing your work, but um, in terms of the committee's engagement, we can easily get waylaid by that. And, um, and I'm, I'm hoping we can keep on top of this stuff, but also as a committee, have all hands on deck in terms of making sure we do that. Which is part of the, it's why there was a, a tiny little teaser at the end, but it's gonna be bigger in the future agendas. And actually, do we have, we don't have the attachment the hand, we don't have the handout for um, meeting topics, do we? Yeah, it was distributed. Yeah, there was one distributed today for the Amherst School Committee. Uh, did we distribute it electronically to the committee? Yeah, we got to do that. Because um, one of the goals that we're from the retreat of having a list of the topics that either, either the topical things that we figured when they were likely to come up in meetings, but also sort of the ordinary, we always have our budget meetings at this time things. We actually have, a, see there it is. I, I'm not, we have, we'll hand it around. I mean, there's, the, there's the, uh, the draft calendar that has those things on it. So I apologize that wasn't circulated. We'll make sure the full committee has it. You can make copies, there's a copy. Okay, that would be wonderful. Uh, and
and seeing that is done. Um, Mr. Anthony, yeah. just one quick question. I'm wondering if we could introduce the newest member of the committee. We're about to do that. Oh, great. If you notice, the next Should item on the, if you notice the next item A is student school, student school committee representative. Yes, and so I was literally about to say, with that, <laughs> you may have noticed we have someone sitting here with us who has not previously been sitting here with us. Do you want to make an introduction? Sure. So Zebulon um, is a student who has been involved in student government and uh, was connected to other students, like the student last year who was the student rep on the school committee. And uh, Ms. Haygood uh, talked about a process at the high school to identify someone who would be an excellent representative of the high school student body, who had strong opinions, who wouldn't be shy to share them. Uh, but also was a good listener and could connect with a large group of people who are elected officials and staff. And we're thrilled you're here. We've heard wonderful things about you from Mr. Jackson and Ms. Haygood. And I just want to thank you for your service as it starts. Welcome. Thank you. Do you have anything you want to say? You can say it otherwise. I mean, not really. <laughs> <laughs> and don't, don't be shy, though. If anything comes up you want to talk about, ask questions. Um, I hadn't thought about this, but if we'd done that at the beginning, one of the coolest things is you can actually ask questions of the superintendent during his update <laughs> and, and grill him, uh, if you want. Um, Seems like you might be encouraged. <laughs> yeah, well, why not? Uh, so well, welcome. Uh, uh, on to item B, physical disability access discussion, which is also encompasses the question of whether we're going to do some sort of a survey. Yeah, so um, I want to thank Mr. Bodington for his kind comments earlier and sharing his, his, his experience and his family's experience in our school district. And uh, I think the idea is a great one. And I've talked to um, Dr. Brady is also sick, so she's not here. Otherwise, she'd be here to share a little more. Maybe I'm spending too much time with Dr. Brady or vice versa. I don't know. Um, but um, what we've done since we got the communication from Mr. Bunnington is we reached out to um, a couple vendors who specialize in doing, uh, completing ADA audit, audits in schools. Um, we did that in a couple ways, um, just talking to other, um, Dr. Brady talked to other student service directors in the area. Um, one of them actually did a ADA audit in a, an elementary school that's part of our region. It's not part of a district I work for, but it's in the four regional schools, um, four regional towns. And um, so we got a pretty good sense of the cost and what we could come out of that. And I think as Mr. Bunnington said, uh, some things are pretty obvious and we know are problematic, uh, and other things are less visible unless you uh, are experiencing them uh, through a lens that not many of us have uh, about looking about mobility and how that works. And we think it completely makes sense to follow through on Mr. Buddington's suggestion, um, and we feel like you know through our facilities revolving account that the cost is something that we'd be able to, to manage without affecting other budget items that we have. So we are actively pursuing support for getting this done in the current year. And one of the reasons we feel such urgency, uh, in addition to the what Mr. Mr. Buddington shared, is we would like to see if we can get this done before we get to a budget season and capital requests. Um, one of the frustrating things. Uh, and I think it played out actually in, in one of the stories that Mr. Buddington shared, was that the capital process can seem exceedingly slow when there are things that need to be fixed that are high cost because it's a process that involves, uh, depending on the time of year, uh, right, a request that's made, discussion of this body, then it goes to all four towns, it goes to town meetings, but historically it went to four town meetings to be passed. The money then became available July 1st, uh, many of these projects can't be done except when students aren't present for long periods of time. So if the money becomes available. Some, we try to get it done the summer that the money becomes available. Sometimes that's not possible for a whole host of readings. So we'd really like to have the audits done on the sooner side so that when we get into capital season, it can be part of that consideration discussion about what the needs of the district are. Um, so I, I think we'll have more to share at the next meeting in October about where we are, but we've um, three estimates from three different um, organizations, and we've already checked references on a number of them. I want to thank Dr. Brady, who couldn't be here. She's done most of this work, and I've connected with her quite often on it. And I really want to appreciate the public comment and the idea about uh, how do we think about the accessibility of buildings, and, and the first way is understanding where our buildings are accessible and where they're not. Um, just as a little background, I should have started with the ADA code, and not that I'm an expert in this, but one of the challenges that our buildings were all at the regional level were all built many, many years ago. The high school had their last major change in 1998. And code, the ADA code continues to change and provide more and more access and mobility uh, for students and uh, families and staff members. But unless you're doing a major update, 
things aren't so visible because buildings were, these buildings were built before that thinking went into the design of buildings. And so we know that there are many areas of these buildings that are not accessible, and having a better grasp of where those are specifically with ideas of what it would take to fix it, it would be a really positive outcome for us to bring back to the committee to discuss uh, as we look to capital for uh, FY20. So a couple of things before we uh, broaden discussion. One, the answer to the question of are we going to do an ADA <coughs> survey, to use a shorthand for it, of our schools is yes. And the answer to whether we're going to do it ideally in a time frame that allows us to build in at least some of that work into this coming year's capital budget is yes. Um, do you, do you um, just as a matter of scope, and you may have said this at the beginning, so I apologize if I'm zoned out on this. Uh, what buildings does this include? So uh, at this point, since we're at a regional meeting, we're looking at the regional buildings, but we are looking at the buildings in our other, Dr. Fadium. Can I ask you a funny question? Yeah. If you forgot where you were, yeah. and you answered like just an ordinary person on the street, yeah. what buildings are going to be included? We are looking at all the buildings that I'm superintendent of. Okay, thank yeah. you. <laughs> I, I apologize, but it's sort of like I. No, I just try to be cautious. But no, I know, I know, but we, we promise we won't discuss the elementary school buildings in this meeting. Um, but the answer to the question is they're, they're part of it. Uh, cool. So the committee have comments or questions or anything? Yeah, I just wanted to um, read a letter that our CPAC chair um, had asked CPAC liaisons, which some of to read okay. as part of this. Um, uh, this is from Nancy Stewart, our, our chair at CPAC. Uh, she was going to read it, but she wasn't able to be here tonight. Uh, CPAC would like to express our appreciation to the Bunnington family. The Bunnington family has reached out to CPAC and made us aware of accessibility barriers facing our students. These accessibility barriers have prevented some students from participating in a true inclusive learning environment. Our students, families, and staff deserve better. Today I am writing on behalf of CPAC. CPAC is requesting that, it, that the district conduct a formal review of our school's buildings compliance with the ADA standards and design requirements. This re review should be completed by an outside consultant. This consultant should be familiar with ADA standards for accessible design. Reviewers should seek to understand from community members currently in our buildings how these accessibility issues are affecting staff, students, and families. We are requesting that the results and findings of this review are shared with CPAC. The district has a legal obligation to provide our students with an inclusive learning environment in every facet of school space. Our students have a legal right to participate fully to their ability in all school activities and school sponsored events. Please consider CPAC's request as a district priority. We look forward to partnering with the district and creating plans to accomplish fixes to ensure our schools are inclusive learning environment. That's the end of the letter. Um, and I just wanted to thank Mr. Bunnington for raising this issue at CPAC um, and emailing us and coming up to speak. Um, I think it's always good for us to get objective information and then hear it personally. And, and I really want to um, uh, point out, uh, I, I really appreciate the, the mode in which he engaged both CPAC and, and the committee. He wasn't accusatory, and yet he was very clear and matter of fact. And um, particularly since most of these changes are going to be helping uh, students that come afterwards, it was really in the service of continuous improvement of our district. So mm -hmm. um, the model of interacting with our committee, I thought. So I, I really appreciate that. Yeah. One of the things that uh, came to mind in the discussion um, in the public comment and also your explanation, um, I think the ADA compliance uh, study will probably tell us a lot about our building in terms of how we meet the regulatory requirements. I'm assuming that's sort of their general um, you know, concentration area. Um, I think it would also be interesting to know if they have experience um, in the broader issues that got brought up, um, you know, because entering a classroom or entering a stage is one thing, but to really um, not have the building put up boundaries is a little bit of a more of a stretch goal than the than the law necessarily is going to provide. Um, and so I'm wondering where we can get that sort of input if that will be coming from an ADA um, study or whether there's some other resources we could reach out to in addition to the family's experiences that might um, help us kind of craft a long-term plan for our buildings. Yeah, so my sense from all, all, all of the different vendors that we spoke to is that they're highly conscious of some of this is about code <coughs> and some of this is not about code and it's about that feeling of inclusion and I think you're speaking about that I heard also from Mr. Bunnington. And um, the good news that I've come to understand is that the code is getting 
a little bit broader. So some of this, I mean, I want to take a step back. So when we think about building being up to code, the code changes, but buildings aren't forced to be up to the current code unless they do major renovation in the building. So I think, I just want to make sure everyone has that common set. So when we think up to code, it's up to code as if we were doing, if, if this is building was built in 2018. Um, and not when it was current, when it was built, but either before code or when the code looked very differently. But the updates of the code are, are getting a little less technical, I and mean, there's still the technical aspects, but they're getting to include more broadly things that affect the individual experience of folks who are in buildings, it's not just school buildings. Um, I think the, the comparison I'm making, and it's, it's not the best analogy, but um, if you look at uh, green building codes or um, lead code, there's an awful lot that's not actually about literally like the energy efficiency that's about how close is it to a bus stop right can people get there without driving a car right and and ada code is getting similar to that where it's not actually just technically about the quote unquote energy efficiency in terms of that but it's it's actually looking at the broader surrounds of what is the experience of someone who may have mobility challenges entering the school being in spaces in the school assuming the school is empty assuming the school is full and that those range of experiences. So with every version, I think it's getting not less technical, but it's being more inclusive of the technical and the less technical aspects. Yeah, there may be barriers to entry that are not part of the code. How are you going about determining those? So I think all the firms we spoke to, I think it's similar to the point of, um, that Ms. Kaczynski um, Raised, they're looking at both, you know, the things that are in the code, but also the lived experiences of individuals in the building. Okay. Are there other comments or questions? Seeing none. Uh, thanks. We we'll look forward to. I mean, let's keep this on the agenda in the near term, so we can keep on top of what's happening and provide the public also with that awareness. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, item C, strategic planning update. So are we actually running ahead of time? Shh, don't say it. <laughs> that happened last two days ago. That's what happened. We were on time and then we blew it up. Just uh, I, I apologize. I, I ownership of the person I, I who said that. I, 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 wasn't, I wasn't saying that out of any undue superstition or thereof. Uh, it's actually, I mean, one, apart from the fact that it's utterly astonishing, um, it's also just because I, you know, I, I'm hoping at some point in the near future we don't get to an item that people wish, you know, they, they couldn't get here until 7.50 and they really wanted to hear it. So I hope that's not the case. And it is being taped, so hopefully they can catch up a little later. Yeah, and so in the packet, this was toward the very end. I think it's like the third and the second to last page, because that's where we're going to the agenda. So if you're looking at this uh, document that looks like this, um, mm -hmm. let's see if I can keep with the pace of the meeting, um, so I think I'll, I'll do some brief description, and I'd like to come back with more detail at the next meeting, um, either in October or November. So, um, we, we continue to work with Dr. Musad, who many of you met last year when he came to school. So maybe we could certainly invite him to come back. Uh, I think it would be worthwhile at some point to have him come back and yeah. uh, talk about his facilitation for work. And what you see is that there's two, we're using the Planning for Success template, which is in process, which is a DESE supported process around strategic planning. And, <coughs> excuse me, it, um, if you look at the page before, it has some, you know, an FAQ about strategic planning in Amherst uh, as well that um, Dr. Mursad has put together. Um, I think actually the middle school principals are going over this in, at the middle school open house as they're soliciting participation from folks. We, we developed with Dr. Mursad a sort of more condensed document to describe what strategic plan about, why are we doing this, what's the process look like. Um, so it'll allow for a little easier access because strategic planning can, can get, um, a little cumbersome to talk about, so uh, we asked Dr. Massad to work with us to involve that. So there's two teams that are working concurrently. So there's a leadership team, uh, which involves uh, principals, assistant principals, directors, Dr. Uh, Cunningham and myself. And then there's also a planning team. The planning team is uh, what we're going to be forming in the next month or so. And that's a 30, 35 person uh, broader group that involves many of the people on the leadership team but also in, uh, include parent guardians, uh, folks from representative agencies like CPAC, um, School Equity Task Force that will be invited to be part of it. And the reason that there's the rationale of having two groups doing in some ways similar tasks 
is it highlights the diversity of thought in the group, that it's important for the ed educational leaders to be able to um, have conversations. It's also really important for them to hear from the larger community. And so it's the one challenging thing about the chart is that timeline doesn't, it's not chronological. Like if you look at like where we are on the leadership team, we've had two meetings, we have another one next Wednesday, whereas the first planning team meeting doesn't happen until Halloween. Um, so you have to orient yourself a little bit that way. But in general, the process on both sides is, is starting with the visioning, trying to uh, get folks to be open and open, ask open-ended questions about what we want for the future of the district, what we want that to look like, what does it feel like uh, five years from now in the district, what would one imagine that to look like, um, to engage the community, to have a broad stakeholder group of folks doing that, um, and for that to be recorded. And then Dr. Massad, one of the key roles he plays is he records everything at every meeting, and it's incredibly important that we come up with this treasure trove of what um, different people said at each meeting so that we can come back to it, and it becomes an artifact, particularly on the planning team of the work that, that occurs. Um, after that happens, we get into data to better understand. So we thought about the future, we then go back to the present to understand what's currently happening, what data do we have that describes um, our experience. And by data, we could look at achievement data, climate data, perception data, um, and, and the group will define the data it wants to look, look for. And we have, you know, we're often in the drip category of data rich information poor because we have so much data. And this is actually saying, what do we really want to look at and dig deep on to tell us what, what, where we are currently? Um, at that point, you use that data to come up with a root cause analysis. So, in, in essence, why do we think these trends are emerging in our schools? What might be factors? And we develop, hypothesize. Um, and that, that process is really important because you want to compare where you are maybe how we got to where we are, to where we want to be. And that's the, the thrust of the first couple meetings is that process of identifying the present, what led us to the present and the future, and the gap between where we are and, and, and where we want to be. Um, that really leads to thinking about outcomes, what outcomes do we want to track, what outcomes do we want to stay with over time, um, and how does that drive initiatives. So we want to think about the outcomes being five years from now, what do we want for our students, what do we want for our schools to look like, the initiatives come from how do we get there? What's the gap between you know the future, the present, what we want for the future, and what's a path where? And, um, uh, I'm being a little verbose. I apologize, but I think it's just worth you know, taking the time to walk through this. Um, at that point, we can get to a vision statement of um, defining that both the process and the outcomes we want. Um, we want the quality plan review, and essentially what that means is we have, even if you have 35, 40 people working on something, we actually want to get broader stakeholder input than just those 35 or 40. We don't want to bank on the fact that they're perfectly representative of the larger community. That's a, that, that would be, it's impossible to create that scenario. Um, so we want to make sure that we're sharing that, whatever the draft is, that with the broader community as well as the committee, to get a feedback along the way in an iterative fashion. Um, and that, that process, you know, we have some placeholder dates there because we know some, in some communities that process can go a little uh, more quickly and some, pro some communities that process takes a little more. So we, working with Albert, we want to have placeholders to say maybe this will go as smooth as four or five meetings that can happen and maybe we need five or six meetings for that to happen. This, the second page uh, really gets on developing the action plan. So if you have that long range vision, you've got initiatives that you want to have moving forward, then you want to break it down into what do we actually, how do we get from where we are, not to the five-year plan, but what does that look like in year one, year two, and getting a little more fine grain in the details, um, because at the end of you know, what I'll call the strategic plan, the green section here, the creating the plan, you're still at that you know broad, somewhat broad level of what are the initiatives going to get us, what are the outcomes we want, and then you have to say, how are we going to get there? And so that's that second phase of developing the action plans um, is getting very specific, very detailed, uh, both on the um, action processes as well as the outcomes we look for as interim outcomes. Even if we have five-year outcomes, we don't want to wait five years to say, oh my goodness, we weren't doing well all those years. We want to have those interim measures uh, built in. And I think the last thing that I didn't say for the planning team is we're looking, that'll be, I didn't mention staff as well. Staff are a key component of the the plan to the parents, guardians, larger community, but staff members, and, and both principals, uh, the principals of all three of our secondary schools have already spoken about this with their staffs uh, on the orientation day, uh, and I did a convocation at a, at a general level, but this will be a primary, uh, some of the primary work of our district this year. So, so I have an awkward question to ask at a school committee meeting. Um, what's the role of the school committee in any of this? 
So we, uh, we're going to ask for school committee representatives on the planning team, and that our plan is to bring this back frequently to school committees so that you're getting not just to get the rest of the process, but actually some of the products, products excuse me, that are being developed, and that's part of the iterative loop. And the benefit is, is twofold. One is that you're the elected officials of the four communities, uh, and you should be a part of that whether you're literally at these meetings or not. But also, this is a public meeting, so it's important that we're sharing this information with the public. People can come to make public comments and offer their opinions in public ways, which we want to engender the kind of transparency that that would create. Yeah, I mean, the thing we've talked about as an objective is to have um, a three to five year strategic plan, annual action plans, and then have that tied not only to budgeting decisions, the prioritization, how we sort of organize our work, and also to the superintendent, your, your annual goals, right. and the evaluation of those goals. So I think that um, there are very practical reasons to have the school committee involved and so I, I would hope that we'd have at least a couple members of the school committee that would be involved in the planning team um, i recognize that would probably take a lot of work or time on their part so at some point maybe in the next meeting we have there should be if we could get some sort of i don't know what people would want but some sort of description around what the commitment would look like for that it'd be ideal and then what, what you know based on the sizing of the planning team what the, what the right number of that is. We can talk about that later. Mm -hmm. um, and then try to figure out how to have the committee engaged in an iterative manner with sort of the deliverables that come out of that. Because um, it would be um, a disaster <laughs> if, there, if there was some sort of gap between the way the, the committee was understanding and thinking about this work and what the actual product was. That would basically mean this didn't this is a failed process, right? I mean, that, that can't happen. Yep. It has to be something where there's a felt tidal lightning in it. Mr. Yeah, so, um, so first, very small comment. On the FAQ, if you're going to use this for a public yeah. distribution, you want to make it real clear, clear as about the region? Oh, yeah, okay. that's true. If you're not totally in the weeds on this, that's pretty easy to confuse. Um, so my bigger question was, was the point Mr. Nakajima raised, which is, it, it is interesting um, in this whole process of coming up with the district plan, which, I mean, according to the planning for success model, should really be driving everything, right? I mean, when we do superintendent goals, it should be in line with that. We, if we do school committee goals, they should be in line with that. Um, and, it, and it, you know, it ends with an action plan, which, which will we'll tie right into what our focus is. So, so the lack of mention of the school committee is, is notable in that, and I realize this is just talking about the two teams. Um, I know you mentioned, you know, I'll come back for you know, update of how it's going, and you know, here's what the del deliverables are. Um, but it, it it leaves me a little confused as to what the role of the planning team should be, and what the role of the school committee should be in defining the five-year mm -hmm. strategy. Because um, you know, it, it it's on the one hand, it's great to have that big of a community group that's willing to engage for that long, um, and you know, we want to take full advantage of that level of community input. Um, on the other hand, you know, it's, it's Wednesday mornings, so anybody who has a job can't do it. Um, and, um, and I'm sure that t t if time wasn't a factor, we would all love to be, <laughs> you know, talking about strategic plan for hours. And so um, I, I feel like the school committee's role in this should be a little bit more um, in the definition phase and, uh, and, and have a little bit more say in, the, in where it's going. Um, I guess, I mean, I don't want to sound too, <laughs> you know, negative about it, but it, it, I also, the other thing is I, w I wouldn't want to set people's expectations up wrongly who, who are going to volunteer a lot of time, mm -hmm. their own time, uh, for the planning team and saying, you know, you're going to be defining the, the vision and then get to the end and have the school committee maybe have a different point of view on it. So, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not trying to criticize, I'm just trying to say I don't understand yet where those two pieces come in. Can I respond to that briefly? Sure. Um, so, and I apologize about my best. So I think at the end of the plan, what's not explicit on here is that that plan would then be brought to the school committee for a vote, which is a little different than what you're saying, but I think it's an important piece, because I'm not talking, it doesn't totally address your question, but I think it, I wanted to say that out loud at this meeting, that a strategic plan would, would be brought for, for the committee to offer feedback and vote on at the end, which is different than the involvement piece and how that iterative piece would work, but I think it's worth noting. Um, so, I think we've been talking about the process here for uh, a little over a year, mm -hmm. or close to. 
Um, and I think one of the things that um, I found notable about it was that um, the process was one that was trying to get a broad community input into the process. And at first, I, when I talked to Dr. Musai, about how do you, you know, there's a lot of people, how do you filter that down into actionable things, right? You, designing a strategic plan by committee sounds like a nightmare, right? Um, in terms of trying to manage everybody's expectations and inputs. And I think this process allows a pretty large group um, to get some input in at various stages and, and the whole community to have some input at various stages. Um, and from my perspective, sitting here at the school committee, I think it, it's wise for it not to be a strategic plan based on the nine of us at this table, um, that the school serves a much broader community than we necessarily represent at the table. And so um, I think we'll have opportunity in the process to provide some input, um, especially I think you know if there's somebody who is able to be a member of the planning team. Um, and that I, I kind of would like, from my perspective, like to see the process um, turn out. I think there were some good examples of the process um, gone through at other schools and the outcomes seemed very, people were very positive about the strategic plan that was generated out of them. Um, so I guess my summary point is I think I'm, I'm confident that the process that we've chosen is going to be one that um, will get us a result that the, the four towns can support the strategic plan. Um, from a, from a broad sense. Um, I actually, I, I think I, I would agree with that um, for the most part that I think that what I'm looking for more than anything else I think is the input from, from staff and from administrators and from the community to help shape the direction of our schools. Um, I think both from expertise perspective, also just from direct impact um, that seems to be the right approach and it seems to make the most sense to me. I do think though that, you know, incorporating at least uh, art articulating the points where the school committee will be involved mm -hmm. in this grid will be helpful because yeah. it's something for us to work towards and then also to be mindful of as we're building other agendas mm -hmm. to move forward to think that, you know, yes, we want to have this point sort of done and ready to share with the committee for input and feedback and all that. I would also add that I think uh, adding in, I see a couple of places where it's explicitly said community engagement. And I think again, just to help people understand what we're working towards and when we're, we're ready to, you know, even though those might shift a little bit, but at least seeing multiple points throughout this grid and, and to, to be aware that we are planning for that community engagement in very big ways uh, will help people to understand that this is definitely a process that requires and, and demands their, their feedback and their input. Um, aside from that, I mean, I think that, you know, most of this timeline makes a lot of sense. I'm really glad that we're doing this. I think mm -hmm. it's, it's vitally important. Um, and I, I hear a lot of the frustration that's, you know, been going through uh, the community, I think, for some time now that we haven't had something like this. So it's great to say that we finally have a plan in action that has been rolled out that is, you know, ready to go. So I'm looking forward to, to seeing this develop. Um, and I think one thing that might also be nice is that um, I might, you know, what I assume is this would be an ongoing effort, that right now this is the begin, the first step to have a, a team to develop a three-year plan, then there's, you know, they'll be following up on that. Um, and so, and that's, you know, one place where we overlap with the school committee because mm -hmm. we, that goes into our, into the year evaluation. Um, but just maybe making that clear, like how that process would go, would continue on in the coming years, and what. You know, so, so I, I mean, I think, I think all the points that have been made resonate with me. I mean, obviously, you, I mean, in my view, the leadership team logically is comprised of the educational leadership of the district, and that's appropriate, and it's the way it should be. Um, and you want to engage the community and stakeholders and you want to know that they're helping to define the product and the output and the, and the shared vision. I actually agree with Mr. Demling on the other hand, that this looks like, the, 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 dot, the, the chart looks like something written by somebody who didn't really think of, didn't, didn't sit down and they thought about the role of the community 
and they thought about the role of the educational leadership, but they didn't particularly conceptualize what the role of the school committee is. And I don't think that's the end of the world, but I think it needs to be called out more specifically, both in terms of having, I mean, I think it's appropriate if we're gonna have school committee representation on a planning team to identify them as a specific stakeholder because from a sort of legal and statutory perspective, if you have the educational leadership of the district, you also have you know, the elected board that's overseeing them. And I think they, they're different than just other community people who might be choose to be involved. They, I think they have a formal role. We, they, conceptually. <laughs> um, we have a formal role in the process that I think should be called out. But I think that's also important because sort of as a, as a normative element, what it does is it organizes and structures our time so that we're thinking about how this reflects goal, annual goals for the committee, for the superintendent, budgeting and prioritization, the fact that at the end of this product, there actually is gonna be a vote. And I think, so I think there's a, po I think it gives clarity to the public. It also gives even clarity to the committee because if there's a couple of people in the committee who are able to volunteer their time to work on this, it's not like, I mean, I, I mean this in the nicest way. I don't mean this negatively, but we have subcommittees where it's sort of like, go off to the audit committee, do no harm, give nice feedback, listen to interesting audit, like, you know, no one really thinks that anything's happening in that subcommittee that necessarily is rocking the world and changing the world, necessarily. And you kind of hope there isn't, because if there isn't, this is a real problem. Um, this is sort of the opposite of that. This is something where whoever's working on behalf of the school committee is going to have a real obligation to reflect back. And then the committee itself, and not, that, not that any of you would or I would, but you, you, we can't check out, right? Because at the end of this process, there's going to be something coming forward that's going to then guide all the work we do. So I would just say, I think, I agree with everything we said here, but you got, you got to call out the school committee more and just and lay out where we're fitting yeah. in the process, and then I think think about where we're involved in the committee. I don't yeah. know if the committee makes that makes sense to people, or is it more sense? Yeah. Yeah. I completely agree, and, and what I didn't bring this time was a document from last spring, which talked about different stakeholder groups, and the school committee was was on that stakeholder group that would be part of the planning team. So I apologize for not being more explicit about that here. Um, and I'm talking to Dr. Musad tomorrow, so I'll. I'll talk through uh, and bring back more specifics around the touch points and the, uh, where not just the committee members who may join the planning team, but the full committee gets to review. And, if, and uh, this is one of those things where I think if the vice chair is willing, uh, I would volunteer myself <laughs> in the vice chair. We can say no, right? But I mean, it's you know, time or whatever. But I mean, but if, but if it's possible, I think both, both of us can, should, act, should actually talk to, I mean, yeah. either, you know, as you're going through that iterative process, right talk to us and sit down so that we can help reflect back what we're hearing and, and help just so that the next time there's a draft that comes forward, it'll right. probably be entirely baked and everyone look and say, this is perfect. Yeah, that so makes total sense. Yeah, Mr. Dillon? Um, yeah, so I, I like what Mr. Nakajima spelled out about on the school committee understanding what those touch points are and you know, hopefully we have available time on the committee, um, people who can be there to sort of report back. Um, I think in addition to sort of calling the school committee's role out, um, uh, calling out major points of opportunities for community input at all stages would, would also be good because there's going to be a number of people who would really want to do this who absolutely can't because it's on Wednesday mornings. Um, and so they're going to be like, okay, I want to be able to provide input with, in more than just a email the team whenever you want kind right. of way. You know, and, and before, it, the, like, the vision is baked, right? And, so, and, and all the other things flow down. So having that as, as kind of the the header timeline, I think, will be important for people to feel like, well, if you if you didn't, you weren't able to get on that large committee, you know, so it's nice to get that many voices. You, you start to get a little bit of the benefit of the wisdom of the crowd, but it's not necessarily 100% representative of everybody and, and all their concerns. So, um, just you know, it, it's so, uh, it's good to hear that that's that's a primary focus of the team. Yeah. Very briefly, and one of the reasons the one of the primary topics in the first day of the planning team's community engagement is, you know, we, we met down and talked about it and you know, Dr. Rasad's opinion, I tend to agree with him, is it's great for a small group to talk about community engagement, better for 35 people coming from different um, towns, communities, micro communities, to then talk about how to engage the, you know, um, the larger communities and the smaller communities with, within our towns. And so that topic isn't engaging that group, that topic is actually gathering a plan that the planning team can work on to how the process can be very inclusive. So uh, it's intentionally not on here because it's designed to be part of the process where the planning team helps draft and work on how to engage the community.
Right. So are there any other questions or comments? Otherwise, we'll move on from this item right now. Seeing none, we'll move on. The next item on our agenda is superintendent goals discussion. Do we have, do we have anything to reflect to, or are we going to talk? Okay, you want to start talking? I would. Um, so, uh, what's worked well for <laughs> by, by the way, this means we'll be listening. <laughs> I just want to clarify that, so it's apparently that's what it's worked. Well, mostly I'll, I'll talk briefly now. I'm actually looking forward to listening. So, um, you know, Sharon and I spoke, and, and I think what's worked well in the other districts is hearing from the committee about some of their, not looking for anyone here to draft goal, but some priorities you have. I shared about some of the work streams that um, on the administrative side we'll be spending a lot of time on, but uh, what I didn't want to do was draft goals prior to hearing from committee members about some thoughts on priorities. Um, so what I'd like to do is just, uh, I wonder if we can just go one by one, if people want to share, so I can take notes on that, uh, and come back to the next meeting with some goals drafted That's that includes some of the themes that I hear from committee members. Okay. Uh, and is it possible that, so are we, how many meetings do we have in October? One. So are we going to try to talk and vote at the same time as okay, I left that out as well. I apologize. It's okay. You're not feeling well. Yeah. Um, so my hope was I'd take this in and I'd share it electronically with the committee and could take individual feedback before we get to the potentially 16th, 23rd, whatever that meeting yeah. date ends up being. Um, so that it well, wouldn't be collective feedback. I could take that individual feedback to make edits before the meeting. Occurred. Just sort of putting that people in the front of, I guess your mind, but also <laughs> everyone else's mind, that we'd be voting on this soon because obviously the years were already into the year. Uh, so here's what we can do. We can start on one end, go around each committee member. If you want to pass and think about it for the moment, we can come back to you. Uh, no, I'm saying if you don't have anything to say at the moment, you'll have something in a moment, then you can pass. Yes. Pass, okay. Well, I'd just like to say, it sounds like we should really be trying to, just trying to go back by my piece of paper that was the superintendent's update, but it, it seems like you laid out some very reasonable, um, bullets on, under item five on your update for key work for 2018-2019. Um, so I guess the one thing that's not on here that definitely was an issue um, last year and I think should continue to be on our radar and your goals it would be kind of continuing that work to make sure that the hiring process is um, transparent, inclusive, you know, that we're continuing to try to really increase the diversity of our of our staff um, and educators and all of it. Mm -hmm. um, I will also um, reserve the right to come back and give you another comment from my phone, uh, by email or, or later on tonight. Um, and then I think this ADA work, I mean, it seems like that could fall under the bro a broader idea of inclusivity that this hiring could also be a supplement on, but I, I guess I just don't see that explicitly laid out in those those bullets there, mm -hmm. so I'd like to see something related to that. And where we can, I mean, I, I, I just think we should try to, given this strategic planning process and all of these things going on at the same time, it would be great to have a way for us to organize this so it's, in, there are intersections for you, so it's not like five different masters you have to answer. Sure. Um, okay, I'll give you, Three, as quick as I can, just ideas to think about. They're not fully formulated. Um, you mentioned early start time. Um, so I'm not saying a goal should be to change the early start time. <laughs> but I would like to be able to know what are the barriers right now to us even thinking about it. Is it just because our plate is too full? Okay, then at what point does our plate get less full that we could start thinking about it? And then if we did, do we have plans we could take off the shelf? What does that deal even look like? Um, another thing is, um, promoting or somehow raising the profile or expanding the integration of our arts. Um, I, th I constantly feel like our arts, in, the, in a, both the middle school and the high school, are so amazing. They're like so over the top. If you could, if we were known for nothing else, you know, uh, you, you, could, you could put arts up on and, uh, and emphasize what an amazing job. And I think it's because we do so many other things well and we have so many other priorities that it doesn't necessarily get all the attention. When you look at it, it's, it's amazing. And so this is kind of related to marketing and promotion, kind of related to arts integration, but I, um, it's, it's, it's the programming, it's, it's the staff. We have some just incredible staff and teachers that are of the reason why the delivery is so amazing. Um, just I'd love to have a specific goal that leveraged that resource, right? 
Um, and I guess the third thing, it, it was just a really less formed thought. Um, when I saw the, the um, attendees at the anxiety presentation, that's pretty huge for a start of year um, a topic like that. Um, and uh, so this kind of goes under the general heading of supported students' well-being. And it made me think of um, a question I had asked you during the, um, during the hiring process. And you know, if money was no object, you know, what, what, or what concerns you? And we are talking about student preparedness uh, at the very earliest ages and, and what we can do. And um, you know, we see this in preschool a little bit. It's, it's just that there's, you know, life is changing. And um, kids are coming into our schools with a different set of needs and it's kind of hard to articulate exactly what that is sometimes because it there's it crosses three or four different streams there's there's you know some kids who have trauma there's, there's emotional issues there's um pre-education issues there's um there's attention issues you know uh, we talked about a couple days ago at uh, technology uh and its influence and what is that going to be like in 20 years and how does that affect our learners and it all sort of relates to this um what should schools be doing more to empower uh, our students to, to survive and have this sort of self-sufficiency? Um, it's really hard to articulate into a goal, but because you put support of uh, students' well-being as a top bullet point, I thought I would just raise that. Uh, and given that the uh, attention, effective attention on modern technology has been an issue of uh, concern for me as a leader. Thank you. I don't have too much to add. Um, I think um, certainly supporting this ADA audit process, I think that's not just in the, um, doesn't benefit just students with physical disabilities, but in everybody in school. Um, and then support of students well-being is certainly a very broad topic, so maybe we could find some specific ways we could narrow that down, whether it's early start times, um, but that's a great place to start. So, thanks. Can I pass it along? Uh, so I think one of the goals should be around successfully completing the strategic planning process and the first year annual goal. Um, I mean, the framework's laid out, but um, if I'm looking at the end of the year, I think it's really important that, that we, I mean, we ever, actually, just to echo this, I think it was the dominant source of conversation, off topic of conversation at our retreat. Um, and it's, it's kind of funny because it's something that a lot of us expressed that that's not only important, for you and for what goes for the school, but honestly, in terms of organizing the work we do and trying to be as helpful as possible, so I think that so it's it's a funny thing to lay on you, uh, but since you're the educational leader of the district, such is life. <laughs> um, that's one. Um, we previously had a budgeting item on there around uh, managing the four towns and dealing with budget and prioritizing, you know, the quality of support for our staff and teachers and things like that, and I think that's probably a recurrent need. Uh, you know, uh, I think a third uh, thing, which um, can be called out a number of ways, but um, uh, an explicit annual goal around our racial and social justice commitment, whether that's on continuing professional development, support for diversity of hiring and goals for the Atlanta cabinet, or whether that's um, restorative justice and continuous improvement and learning around issues of discipline and things like that. I mean, it could go any number of directions. Um, it could even, frankly, be, and I'm, I'm just making this up, but it could even, on sort of a meta level, it could be about providing leadership around advancing, I think we had six or seven topics that were at various points of development that um, Ms. Cunningham presented on last year. It could even be about trying to advance some element of those things in the context of what's achievable uh, at, at the moment. I'm not, I'm, but my point is, I'm, just, I'm, I'm throwing a couple of ideas on there. My point is we should, one of the goals should be calling out specifically some uh, continued commitment and advancement around that as well. Um, and uh, I, I think, I, I'm, I still, I said this earlier this spring, uh, in the summer that if there was, I don't know what the methodology or the goal would be of trying to ensure continuous improvement around review of administrative or managerial practices in the district, but I still consider that to be important um, without meaning to call it out. At the beginning of our year, there was a, a discussion and a reworking around 
how we handle athletic fees and student schedules. And that was one of those things where it didn't really conform with the values that were set by, I think, the district as a whole. It didn't really conform with the values and more immediate policies that had been set by the committee, certainly around food service collection policy. And yet it's one of those things where we kind of found out about, you know, we sort of discovered there was a problem after the problem blew up as opposed to in advance of it blowing up. And um, I'm just trying to, I mean, this is one of those things where I'm just trying to, I'm trying to help. <laughs> like I'd like, to, I'd like us to get ahead of those things and find some way to more systematically figure out how to get ahead of them. I don't know what that looks like as a goal because it ends up sounding bureaucratic, like review all the existing processes to ensure that they conform with best practices or some garbage like that. And that, 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 I'm not sure that captures the zeitgeist of what I'm trying to get at. That's all I'm Okay, great. So I think mine will echo a lot of what you've already heard, but um, I think diversity, inclusion, and there's various ways that could go, but I, I'd like to see part of that um, for student impact, part of it for um, our staff and the social justice. Um, so maybe that's measured in a few, a few ways. Um, budget and long-term financial plans to stay affordable for our towns. This last budget cycle certainly highlights how most of our towns are, uh, you know, don't have a lot of levy limit left, and we need to think about how our school fits in, into that affordably and efficiently and still providing the education we've come to expect. Um, strategic planning complete, I think, is, is a must-have. Um, professional development of staff, um, we talked a lot about. Um, there's a few initiatives that have um, been going on in the last few years, and I think we can't expect to have really great education for our students if we're not investing in our staff. Um, and then student supports for social emotional emotional learning um, and, the, um, and some of those initiatives that we've started, but I'd like to see them continue. Um, and then to echo this last one is um, some way of uh, measuring or, or keeping on top of um, what other areas, whether it's, um, you know, I think the school committee is trying to review our processes, but that we have, that the school has a similar, you know, continuing review cycle of um, practices within the school to make sure that they're in alignment with, with the district goals. And maybe that's, we need to know what the district goals are first, but I think with it. So I, I think, um, the hard part of going last, I always end up repeating a lot of things. <laughs> That's okay. Go ahead and we'll do that. Finer, we'll put a finer point on that. <laughs> um, so I would absolutely agree. I think in terms of, uh, of uh, racial justice and equity, we have already gone and taken several very important steps in, in the past year. I think with Ms. Cunningham's leadership um, and also with yours, Dr. Morris. Um, but we, we have to do more and we have to do better. And um, the School Equity Task Force is actually in the process right now of recommending some goals um, for the school committee's consideration. And I won't go into them now because we're not on the agenda, but they will be here at the next meeting, hopefully. Um, but I will say that I think to reflect back what has already been said by other committee members, uh, especially focused on the diversity of educators and staff, understanding how incredibly important it is for our staff to actually reflect our student bodies um, and to really think about how we are retaining, recruiting and retaining uh, educators of, staff, uh, of color um, across you know, our, our regional district is incredibly important. Um, the other thing I would also say is I would echo the strategic planning process. I think uh, having you know, an effective kickoff, uh, even if it's a three to five year plan, but making sure that this next year is really well done uh, and buttoned up and that we have robust engagement plans that people understand, that the school committee understands, that the community understands, that you know that there's all of that has been very well articulated. Um, and that also frankly has buy-in from the town. I think that there's you know a lot of that um, that will involve uh, the community and our town leaders uh, to, to be successful. Um, along that last line too, I think uh, we've had this discussion at both the Amherst School Committee and also the region, uh, our capital improvement plan. Um, we continuously keep talking about the you know, trouble that our parking lots are in, that our school you know, infrastructure is in. Um, we really need 
someone to, to take a hard look at what those budgets actually represent and engage them effectively so that we have a, a clear and concise plan, um, not something I think that we can continuously you know, put off uh, because every year, frankly, is a, is a hard budget year. But we need to address these problems and we need to address them very soon. Uh, so I'm, I'm hopeful that we can incorporate that into goals this year as well, uh, even if we have to make room for some other things so that we can make that happen. Um, so I think those are probably my, my three top uh, goals at this point. Um, but I, I do think that, you know, like I said, uh, this, this work group task force will be sharing some other ideas and I'll pass those on to you and to the committee as soon as they're available. Okay. Is there anything else from the committee? Okay. Uh, do you have anything I want to ask of us before we move on? I just want to thank you. That was incredibly helpful to to hear where Good. people were coming from. So um, I'm glad we had this process and I didn't come with something today because the, the, the next round will be much more informed with the comments that I heard from members. So thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Well, that's very, that's nice to hear. I don't know, a little positive feedback. Yeah? We'll <laughs> take it when we can get it. Um, are, you, are, you, are you done? I think I'm going to leave you in the very capable hands of Ms. Cunningham, Mr. Mangano, Ms. Palmer for the rest of the uh, <laughs> evening, if that is okay with the committee. Um, Oh, well, have a lovely evening. Thank you. And we're getting you out of here, by the way, a couple minutes early. <laughs> Absolutely. But no, this is why we this is why we created the extra minutes. Uh, and without objection, a five minute recess. No objection. Five minute recess. Thank you. Uh, we're all here. It's my little plug for training. Uh, calling the meeting back to order. Um, with the, uh, I apologize for you, but with, with the committee's indulgence, just to know folks have been waiting, I'd love to flip the order of the next two items, E and F, and move the resolution in support of the education funding campaign up one item, uh, if that's okay. With the committee has so therefore indulged. Um, and do uh, we have anyone else to speak on behalf of the guy? <coughs> Please? Okay. Ms. Faye. Hi, Jean Fay, uh, president of the Amherst Health Education Association. And um, usually we come once a year, twice a year, and we face the same budget crisis every year. And as you're all very well aware, the um, the foundation budget the review hasn't been done in 25 years. So if the recommendations of the 2015 Budget Review Commission are implemented, then Amherst, and this would be um, through the year 2023, Amherst would receive $264,950. The region would receive $358,000. And Pelham would receive $86,978. Now, I know what the schools can do with that kind of money. Um, you know what the schools can do with that kind of money. What we'd like you to do is consider this resolution. I'm here at the regional um, committee meeting so that I, I can talk to all of the representatives from the towns to join the Amherst Pelham Education Association as well as the Mass Teachers Association and a lot of coalitions around the state and in forcing the legislators to fully fund public ed education so that our kids get the schools and the education that they deserve. It's way past time. And that we're talking about this, is, this is 2015, so we're already behind another two years, and it's just gonna be increasing, and the things are just gonna be getting worse and worse. So, um, for your consideration, I would hope that you would join us um, in asking the legislature by May 1st to pass a budget that is good for public education and provides the kids with the education that all of them deserve, not just students that live in wealthier in wealthier towns and communities. Thank you. Uh, are there, so the, by the way, the, the res draft resolution is in your packets uh, and it could obviously be adapted readily to insert the name of the district and the amount and the closing, therefore be it resolved that the Amherst Pollen Regional School Committee urges the legislature 
Uh, those would be easy edits to make. Um, I guess for the purposes of the, of the public, it says resolution and support of full funding for our public schools, whereas free public schools available to all students without exception are foundational to our democracy and are required by the state constitution, and whereas all of our students, no matter where they live, deserve high quality public schools that teach the whole child and provide them with a rich school experience that addresses their academic, social, and emotional needs, whereas the state's foundation budget formula, which determines state aid to each district, has been woefully out of date for years, therefore underfunding our districts by more than $1 billion a year for essential educational services, and whereas an updated foundation budget formula would bring uh, the Amherst Pelham Regional School District up to $385,000 additional dollars in additional state aid each year, uh, allowing this district to move closer to providing all students with the education to which they are entitled as residents of the Commonwealth, and whereas the legislature failed to pass any foundation budget legislation in the last session, leaving districts, educators, and students without the funds necessary to support the schools our students deserve in every district in the state. Therefore, be resolved that the Amherst Pelham Regional School District urges the legislature to approve and fully fund a new foundation budget formula by May 1st, 2019. Uh, we could adopt this now. We could adopt this, consider ad adoption later. Um, I'm open to the committee's decision on that, depending on how I don't say controversial, but what your what your what your opinions have been? What's to be gained by a delay? Nothing. I'm just I'm saying you're the committee. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not an autocrat, right? It's like the entire point. I could say, do you want everyone? You know, who wants to vote yes, right? I mean, I'm not going to do that. Somebody can move it on the other hand if they want. I was just wondering what's to gain by the delay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Menino, I apologize. You asked a simple question, and you deserve a simple answer. Uh, um, I move to approve the resolution as read by Mr. Nakajima, um, and with the edits that we would come that we would put in afterwards to clarify which uh, region and uh, school committee is involved. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved by Mr. Donia, seconded by Mr. Demling. Are there further comments? Mr. Demling. You know, we talked about this topic a lot, so we don't need to belabor all the details, but I, w I would say for the public's edification, you know, they, they hear us talk about advocacy. You know, all the time, and there can be a little bit of advocacy fatigue. You know, we're always talking about underfunded. We're always talking about this and that. This is a particularly um, uh, focused moment, I think, for state level advocacy. Mm -hmm. um, Ms. Faye talked about uh, working with with other um, organizations. So the MTA is definitely uh, making this a priority. Uh, Mass Ed Justice Alliance, uh, which is a grassroots organization across the state that's been working with teachers and school committees and parents and uh, concerned communities is really activating on this at the same time. Mass Association of School Committees is trying to get on board. And by the way, we all should have gotten an email from MASC asking us about what their priority should be. This <laughs> is certainly a good answer to give them. Um, so it's, it's an opportunity to come together. And you know, like Ms. Faye talked about, about forcing the state, it, not in a rude way, but in a, this has been studied very comprehensively. We know what the underfunding is. And it's that classic uh, retort from the state rep, well, if you want me to pass something, then make me do it, right? It's that political pressure that we need to create. And it, it really is coming into a, a, a moment here, I think. And um, you know, the last thing I'd say about it is that you know, we know the money uh, from these amounts that our district would receive. Um, uh, but I think it's really about towns and school committees across the state coming together. I mean, this is about everybody, right? There, there are towns that are much less fortunate than us in terms of resources who are hurting far worse than we are um, because of this underfunding, you know? And so this is, it's not just the uh, financially advantageous thing for us to do, it's, it's the morally right thing to do. It's the ethically right thing to do uh, to make this a priority for the state and to communicate out to the public that this is the year to find public education. Is there uh, Just wanted to add a comment that I think our state representative um, currently in office um, has expressed support for this issue previously. Um, but I think could probably be reminded um, that there, this is important and this is something for us to continue pounding on. And I think any new uh, elected officials also should absolutely make this a priority because I think in order for it to continue to uh, command the, the kind of, of um, importance that it requires in Boston that we really need to be able to push people to do that. So uh, to Mr. Denlin's point, and I think a lot of the work that we've done already on this committee uh, to help advocate on, on behalf of these issues, we, sh we should continue doing that, but continue to bring in some of our statewide electeds to do that as well. Yeah, that and I think some of the other um, 
select boards, finance committees, and things like that. I mean, we're heading into another budget season for the regional committee, and um, I don't think I'm telling any secrets to say it's probably going to be another lousy season of arguments amongst the four towns. And if you really, the, some of those arguments are becoming really pointed around educational philosophy and how that affects our budget and support for our schools. But the reality is, if you if you pull back for a second, and then you look at the underfunding of Chapter 70, the underfunding of regional accounts, and the diversion of money for charter schools, you can actually see where the pressure is coming from, right? Between unfunded mandates, underfunded accounts, and then a philosophy of draining money from our school districts, I actually think we, I actually think, weirdly enough, this is a propitious moment to organize, because I think there's going to be a prairie fire rebellion in this in this state um, that matches like Prop Two and a Half and Prop Thirteen soon around the ways in which our municipal accounts, our taxpayers, and our schools are getting screwed right now. And uh, but the point is, it won't happen by accident. It'll happen if we organize. So I think we should organize on this. I think we should organize on charter schools. And I think we should organize on our regional regional accounts, all three of them. And we should do it vocally, and we should do it in an organized fashion. Uh, any other discussion on this, though? Seeing none, all those in favor? Raise your hand. Cool. Passes unanimously. Um, we can wrap this up. And <laughs> thanks for bringing it. You we can what, do something pretty with this. <laughs> the letterhead and signatures and stuff like that. Cool. Yes. Yeah, you know, we, we, I think uh, in terms of visibility and, and getting the word out and getting people <coughs> activated, we can also send it out to look for us. Absolutely. We should. I mean, we'll, let's follow up on this later, but we should get it out in general, as well as obviously CC electeds, but also local officials as well as state officials. Great. Yes, uh, licensure update. Imagine what at one point this would have been the talk of the town, the hit, the thing that would be up here with ice cream and you know popcorn. Well, I have good news to share, and that is that all of our principals and assistant principals at the secondary level are fully licensed um, with their 912 assistant principal principal license. So. David Slovin has his professional license. Mickey Gramaki has her professional license. Mark Jackson has his professional license. Talib Sadiq, who's the assistant principal at the high school now, he has his initial license. Uh, Rebecca Sweetman and Joseph Smith, they have their initial license at the 5-8 level. So they're all licensed. Great. Are there any um, follow-up questions? Mr. Are there any unlicensed positions? Unlicensed? Well, oh, any p positions held by unlicensed people. At the regional level, I'm doing an audit right now. And so in my November uh, presentation, I'll be better able to share that. And that would include teaching positions? And mm -hmm. So we've just done the administration. At this I've point. done the administration. Thank you. Okay, great. Anything, anything else? Seeing that, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, okay. So the next item is food, food services update. Mm -hmm. I don't see any trays of food out there. <laughs> Sasha, do you want to come? This is not going to be a show and tell. It's just going to be a tell. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mostly a tell. That's a good way to put it. I've been I've been pestering him for financial details since like June, and he was like, "Can you wait?" So I so I I, apolo I apologize, <laughs> Mr. Sensky. They have put meat on the bones more powerful than any tray of treats could ever be. That is a true statement. So has everyone met Sasha Palmer, our new food service director? Mm -hmm. Sasha yeah. Palmer, new food service director, doing okay. a great job so far. Yeah. So the way we're going to organize this update is I'm going to go through the slides sort of briefly, um, or each slide briefly, and then I'm going to turn over to Sasha, and she's going to talk about the program and what's coming up. Is that microphone? I should be talking. No. Nope. Nope. No. Okay. No. Which actually just means because the microphone's way back there for purposes of that. that way, sort of. Or just like Perfect. at least this way. Okay. <laughs> and then, you know, where's the cone? The cone, exactly. All right. So, so the first thing I wanted to do is thank everyone who helped make the food service program a success last year, um, mainly our kitchen staff, our sustainability coordinator, Jen Reese, um, 
school garden coordinators, maintenance staff, everybody basically who's involved in the program really came together last year to make the program uh, do really well. Uh, some background, just quickly con uh, some context. We had Whitsons um, for about 10 years, and then we had Chartwells before that, so we were outsourced. And this committee decided to bring the program back in-house. So last year was our first year having a program completely run by the district. Um, so what does that mean? Basically all the functions of the management operation came in-house to, to our staff here. Um, so menu planning, food purchasing, hiring and firing, dietetic work, um, state reports, compliance, all that started uh, came to the district staff. Um, so we were in charge of everything that we had done, you know, frankly, in quite a while. And so last year's program was really focused on trying to achieve or at least make progress on the goals that the community visioning group set, which was maybe two years prior. Um, these were the 12 or ish goals that the um, committee had set. And so we intentionally made progress on each of these. Um, so the first one, taste. So we focused on using higher quality ingredients, quite frankly, and you'll see that in the cost, our, our food cost did go up, um, which was intentional. Um, a lot of it was Project Red, so we'll talk more about that grant in a little bit, but we were able to get a Project Red, which provided a guest chef in the schools, um, and he helped introduce several new menu items, which were really popular. And one of the things, just for example, that he did was he gathered feedback on some of those items and tried to get a sense of whether kids like it, you know, between schools, whether kids like it. So this is an example survey that they did. It was a hand survey that they then compiled into this graph. But essentially, the, the green are the yums, the, the blue are the mid. I don't know how you say that, but <laughs> not so yeah. okay, it's okay, um, yeah. where that emoji movie was, right? Um, and then the yells were the, no thanks, they didn't like it. So you can see there's differences across the schools, you know, Crocker Farm really liked the Green Monster Pizza, um, which had uh, vegetables that were grown in our school gardens in it. Um, and for whatever that's nice. Yeah. You know, so. Um, other goals, so scratch cooking, so again, a lot of Chef Sam's new menu concepts were from scratch uh, cooking items. You can see those over on the right. There's um, you know, basically a list of all the new things that we introduced last year. Um, the quality of food, so we started purchasing our food through the Collaborative uh, for Education, which is where most of the districts around here get their food. Um, and then we started working with some more local vendors, when, for example, it's Arnold's Meats, that's where we started getting our hamburgs and um, meat products from. And the good thing about a lot of our new menu options is that the, the model that Project Red uses is that they come in, they taste test with kids first, they kind of build with excitement, then they put on the menu. But more importantly, they train the kitchen staff how to make the items, so that it's something that can be replicated in the future and not just like a one-time sort of, um, you know, thing to drop kids in for one time. So that was good. Uh, there's a picture of Chef Sam, if you guys haven't met him yet. He was going to try to be here tonight with some other Project Red people, but it just didn't work out. Um, that's our spicy flatbread something. Spicy, ch <laughs> spicy chicken flatbread. Spicy chicken flatbread right there. It's a catchy name. Spicy a pop flatbread something. A popular <laughs> item despite the fact it's mystery meat apparently. Yeah. <laughs> but it was very successful. Um, other program areas, so innovation. So we did a lot of new things this year. Um, we created a new, a new website. We were able to get the amherstfood.com, which is, nobody had it. You know, sounds great. Um, very mm -hmm. easy to remember. Uh, more collaboration with the sustainability coordinator, Jen Reese, um, to help bring school garden, what do you call it, the food from the school garden, it's the product or the, the harvest, the harvest. <laughs> to bring the harvest into the um, product <laughs> widget. Oh, that's right. You can tell I am not the <laughs> um, We started using a new software called Mosaic, which is sort of the next most current software product for managing basically the back end of your, your food program. So you can put in all the inputs, you can get the nutritional values, the menus. It, um, we're still working on building it out because it does take quite a bit of time, um, but it's something we're continuing this year. Uh, we had some staff to tell them to help improve their uh, process. We use the electronic notifications where we do balances, um, improve menus to note local and vegan options, which is one of the values that the community vision group created. And then we also did something sort of new in the uh, contractor staff as we created incentives um, around participation. So if um, schools hit participation marks or the, um, the district as a whole hit participation marks, they got bonuses. And so we were actually happy because we were able to give several of them out this year because participation went up quite a bit. Uh, plant to animal ratio. So uh, we wanted to increase the plant to animal ratio. So three of the 10 new um, items that Chef Sam introduced were vegetarian items. Um, and wait times, you know, some of that was difficult because it's not about the infrastructure that we have. So I think the best thing that we did uh, last year to help with wait times was just keep a full workforce. Um, that wasn't the case for many years um, under Whitson, where we had open positions for quite a while. 
Um, some of that was getting a better contract in place, I think to attract more staff, but we were able to keep a full complement of staff um, for most of the year last year. So lunch participation was another goal. So this is sort of a 10-year trajectory of the participation rates for lunch at each district. So Amherst is blue. So you can see Amherst is as high as it's been um, in the last 10, 11 years. Um, but all three districts uh, went up last year. Um, and we hope to see that continue. Um, this is just a total lunch count. So it's not a percentage, but just total lunch counts. And so every single school went up last year in terms of the actual lunch count number from the year before to last year. Um, which is great and even um, better considering that our enrollment is generally going down at the school, so to serve more lunches with fewer kids is a, is a good sign. Uh, community engagement was another program goal, so we did a lot more catering last year than we had in the uh, prior years. We tried to um, connect with some of those really well-known events that happen in Amherst and, and um, work with them and partner with them. So the first day celebration was really the first time we had a real strong presence at it. Um, open houses, the Martin Luther King breakfast, the ultimate tournament was a really big one, uh, provided a lot of um, food for that. So um, there's some other, a lot of these ones and a lot of other ones that we worked with, but um, catering went way up last year. Um, local and organic purchasing, so we added 10 new local or regional vendors and we started serving local organic items four to five times a week um, at, in some element of the menu. Nutrition education, so <coughs> Chef Sam, uh, he, he was in the Chef in Schools program, so part of it was just interacting with students in the cafeteria, when he was doing the taste test, find out what their likes and their dislikes. Um, also the collaboration with the sustainability coordinator, um, see the last piece there, so the garden soil was tested and the students um, basically helped harvest the produce that was gonna be used in the, in the cafeteria. Um, and the two menu items that used that harvest was the school garden soup day and the green monster pizza. So there are a couple other areas that I think were important to note from last year. So workforce development, we had about 50% of our staff turnover, which isn't totally unusual. Um, but I think the staff we did hire have continued to make really strong contributions to the program. Um, we increased the diversity of the workforce. So we went from about 5% staff of color to 35%. And for our cook positions, which is like the next, like the middle position, um, we went from 20% to 60%. Uh, we had more professional development built in. Uh, you know, as part of the contract that we negotiated, um, and we tried to make the PD accessible to everyone. We have a few uh, staff that speak Spanish primarily, um, so we took advantage of our new software for um, an earpiece that basically someone can translate into the earpiece while someone's speaking English, and they can make sure that the presentation is accessible kind of in real time. Um, and the ongoing professional development that Chef Sam provided, basically, he was in schools for 10 months of the year, he'd pick a school each month, and he would provide you know, culinary training while he was doing new meals to each of the, the staff in the building. Uh, we got a new plan of grants last year. So Project Brad was an in-kind grant that was valued at about $26,000. We had Chef Sam, I think, two days a week uh, for the entire year. Um, we had a few other little grants. The other big one um, that Sasha will talk a little bit more about later is the USDA Farm, uh, farm to School Planning Grant. Uh, Sasha had to go to Detroit last week. Mm -hmm. uh, well, the city of Detroit to basically meet with all the other people that got the grant um, and talk about what that's going to look like for this year. Our collection policy, which Eric mentioned earlier, um, we think it's going pretty well in terms of, it's definitely going well in terms of communication. Um, we've had really positive feedback and we've spoken with a lot more families than we have in the past and I think it's working out well. Um, in terms of the data, so this is our overdue balances sort of over at times when we check it. So basically when we go into Nutricator, we check it. You can't go back to a previous date, so you can only get it like on that day. So we've got to do a better job of sort of having regular check-ins that are uh, have, you know, equal intervals. But these are the different intervals that we've checked it over the past several years. Um, so you can see it kind of bottomed out around January of 2018, and we've seen it start to come back up. So it's at about $48,000 as of when I did this. And when I checked it today, it was at about $46,000. So it's making progress to go back up. Um, the big drop happened when we were sort of absent in collection policy at all. That's that time period we see a drop from mid 30s to like 50. That was when we had a policy that was sort of draft, but then it sort of paused for a while and there was sort of this, this nothing grow of it. Um, but we're seeing positive progress with that as well. Uh, Spanish summer program. So the, the blue bar, um, the dark blue bar shows the um, lunches that we've served during the summer. Um, and the light blue is the breakfast and the yellow is snacks. So you can see our lunches have grown 
significantly from the first year we did in 2015 to last year. Um, and last year we also implemented Snack, so that's why that's there for the first time and our breakfasts have gone way up. So um, we added a bunch of new sites. Fort River was new this year. We did all the LSC sports camps. Um, Jones Library was new. Um, and we expanded the high school and middle school. So, so that was really good. To the financials, Audra, ask what about. So, um, this slide, so the first slide, the first comparison there is meal sales. So the blue bar is our meal sales last year and the red bar is our meal sales this year. So we want the red bar to be higher, and it is. Um, the total money we brought in from sales went up. Uh, the next one is our labor costs from FY17 to FY18. We want that one to go down, and it did, which is great. Uh, the one after that is food costs. Those went up. And so we had a, we had a study done by MASBO, which is the Mass Association of School Business Officials. They brought in a couple of food service directors. And they said, really, the target that you want is 50-50 in terms of your labor and your food costs. And so we're making progress to get to that place. When we, in FY17, we were about 30% food and 70% labor. Um, after last year, we're about 60% labor and 40% food. So we're getting closer to that 50-50 mark of having, you know, spending equally on your food. Where did they come up with such a guideline, 50-50? Well, if you're... If you're spending much more on labor than you're on your food, either your food quality is really low or you're spending a lot on your labor. Um, so they, they want to see sort of an evil, even balance of what you're spending on your food versus the, the staff that are preparing that food. I'll give you the report. That's what they recommend. <laughs> um, well, I mean, the goal is quality of the, the service. Now, well, what if it just costs a lot of money for food? Yeah, quality of service, but also quality of the food, right? So, and the last bar here is the management fee, which went from $60,000 to zero, which is one of the financial benefits of bringing the program back in-house. So these are sort of the numbers. So in general, just the bottom line, we went from having a $224,000 deficit in FY17 down to a $150,000 deficit um, in FY18. And what that allowed us to do, too, is put away a little bit extra money in the food service revolving fund to help replace some of the equipment that's getting really old. Um, especially at the elementary level, there's some, as we've heard, capital needs. Um, there's some capital needs for equipment um, that they'll have to replace. So, so reasons to stay excited for next year. Um, USB planning grant, practice in the classroom. I won't spend too much time because Sasha's going to talk about this, but we're really excited to have Sasha here. Um, she brings a lot of experience from the district she's worked in before. Like the first day, she was spotting things at like literally the first day of driving the schools, and she was like, "That fridge doesn't look like the right." Thing. She went in, she's like, "It's not." Um, she's got a real strong background in food safety, in particular. Uh, so we're really excited, Sasha. Uh, All right, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Uh, the USDA planning grant. We are in, that is like, excited to be in Detroit. I had a little of the water and it came out sick, I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> but um, or we are in the, the beginning stage of um, getting together <coughs> committee to um, <coughs> implement that planning grant. We have um, three objectives that we're working with. We have um, food service portion where we concentrate on the menu and, and purchasing local, introducing um, diversity into our, um, our menus. We also have the curriculum development, making sure the educational portion of, of the grant where um, our curriculum development specialists would um, be integral in getting um, farm to, to, the, to school into classrooms and getting kids excited about um, where their food is coming from. And, and how it is is, is is grown. We also have the, the, the farm portion where we, we, and we liaison with farmers and our, our local um, su supporters, our local um, community to make sure that um, we are using and utilizing the resources that we have in the community. I was excited to come into a community where there are so many farms. I started in the summer and um, we had that farm to school showcase and a number of farmers turned up and was excited to be a part of our initiative. So we are in the stages of gathering that team. We would um, like to have as many people as we can on that team who is dedicated to the cause, getting um, fresh local produce in schools. One, one thing that I heard when I just came in was, 
what are you doing about having healthy, fresh, clean <laughs> food in our, in our um, unprocessed food? And being in this area where there is so much resources, we should strive to have um, most of those local produce into our school menus. Um, breakfast in the classroom. I am a champion of breakfast in the classroom. I have um, implemented it in other districts and I see the benefits of breakfast in the classroom. One thing I was um, excited to hear um, sitting in other committees is um, starting school, the school time, starting school a little earlier and that would um, mean that there that would be a great opportunity to serve breakfast after the, the instructional period begin. Right now it's before and kids are not sure that they're there. They don't they they would not and, and we shouldn't be asking our kids to give up breakfast or recess. So having it um a model that that is is after the instructional day starts would be good. We could do breakfast in the classroom or a grab and go option. And that's what we are hoping to pilot in some of our schools in the region. We see opportunities in the middle school to pilot that grab and go option where students can grab that breakfast, walk to their class and sit and have it. So um, hopefully we can start that as um, we are working with Project Bread. They've done a lot of research in this. It's just getting it to all selling it to all the stakeholders who would be involved, getting teachers, um, principals, and, and get parents to buy in to know that there's a fresh healthy breakfast that they can um, send their kids to, to have in the mornings. Uh, the other, the, the, we, I'm, I'm excited to also work with uh, the summit academy and we are planning to op open what is called a summit cafe <laughs> before they were getting their meals their high school kids who were getting their meals from the the elementary menu so they did they weren't um given the opportunity to participate in the variety that the other high school kids um do so right now we're opening we're ho hoping to open that cafe in their newly created space during uh, uh, maybe the last week of October. The students can participate. They'll be the ones to create the logo and name their cafe. They'll have choices. They'll have a number of um, specials per day. On Mondays, they may have taco nights. On Tuesday, make your own salad day. So that's a great opportunity for um, the Summit um, Academy. Uh, and this is, I, 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 this is based on the students' feedback. I went there and I saw how excited they were to, <laughs> to be involved in what they are eating and, and how they want it to look. Okay. That's so that's what we're excited about. <laughs> we made a lot of progress, so happy to answer questions. Yeah, I'd love to open it up to the committee as well as a, a student member if they have any interest. Um, as a direct customer or something. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not trying to put pressure on you. I'm just saying, I think the committee either now or in the future will welcome hearing your thoughts. Ms. Bernina. I have three questions. Uh, what percentage of high school kids eat on campus or, or bring their own lunch? What's the question? Eat on campus uh, or bring your How many do less than half or more than half the high school students buy their lunch here? Less than half. Yeah, about uh, at the high school level, it's like 42% of students buy their lunch to the lunch program. And I mentioned this at our earlier meeting. $3 sounds like you'd get a garbage plate for, for lunch. <laughs> I mean, $3. Have you been to a restaurant lately? Uh, why, why the $3? Why not $5? So some of it's keeping it affordable for families, um, you know, since it is a public school setting, I think the more you go, the more it becomes unaccessible or you might get families not, might not be able to afford it. Um, so again, our prices are comparable to all, all our surrounding neighbors. They're all in the $3 range. So. That, maybe that's why some students feel the meal is inedible. Uh, I'm sorry, it just seems whatever. That's okay. Uh, do, do you have another question? Well, I, no, just two. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. We'll have a fee discussion later. Uh, <laughs> 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 yeah, 
Yeah, I just wanted to uh, say, I don't know who put this presentation together, but you did an amazing job. Mm -hmm. I loved the presentation. I thought it was very clear. Um, you shared a lot of the most important salient information I think that we've been looking for over the past year to understand the success of this program or you know, where the weaknesses were or anything like that. Um, I also you know, so I have to say that it's, it's great to see the increase in, in the take up of, of lunches. Um, and I think you know, hearing even from community members the excitement about finding good food that their kids can actually purchase is huge, um, especially for this community. I think that values, you know, quality organic food. Um, you know, they really want it to, to. They want to see the difference in their in their kids and, and see that excitement there. It's also great to see the grants um, that have come through. Um, I think we've talked a lot on this committee and other uh, you know settings about the importance of trying to get additional grants for you know for this uh, service because we recognize how expensive it is and so it's wonderful to see that. Um, one comment that I just wanted to make, I think we've done again you know a great job in lifting up the participation rates. Um, I do have to say that I think that we still have a long way to go in terms of promoting the, the school program, the you know the in school program. Um, I think that you know there's there's things that we've seen done previously, like the smoothie bike that have been really exciting and fun, and you know people get really you know are into it. Um, I think Chef Sam is a great uh, program. Uh, kids are really into that as well. But I think that there's still a lot more that we could be doing. We've talked a lot about that, right? And going into you know having uh, some of the, the numerous street fairs that we have here in Amherst and the surrounding towns, both during the summer and fall and spring, even in the winter. Um, the farmers market that's you know that takes place here. Just being a presence on a regular basis is incredibly important for people to be reminded of this service and the fact that we've made a change because not everyone may be aware of that. So learning about that will be really important. Um, but then also just to help parents and caregivers understand why this is a more valuable option. Because at, you know, at the end of the day, even $3 a day, uh, if you have multiple kids, ends up adding up. And so you know, there has to be that shift in thinking that this is really important and therefore we're going to make that sacrifice. And that's indeed actually what it is. I think for a lot of families, even families who don't qualify for free or reduced lunch, um, that they still, it's a sacrifice. You know, you're, you're making a decision to probably not pay for one thing if you're paying for this. And I know in our family, you know, we, we often have those conversations with our kids. We negotiate with them, like, well, we'll you know, we'll do school lunch for you today and, you know, we'll take care of something else. And um, I think that the more that we can inspire families and caregivers to understand why this is good and, you know, why this is important and worth doing, the more they would want to do it. And also because, not just because we want to get more money for the program, but also because there's a good shot that if this is a high quality food program, that our, the students in this district are actually benefiting from that, right? They're getting good, healthy meals, you know, prepared for them by people who know what they're doing in-house. And that was the whole point of this program to begin with, to make sure that they're getting the nutritional needs met so that even if they're not outside of the home, that they're getting you know one or two good meals a day. So all of that said, you know, it's there's a lot of value in promoting this program and making sure people understand why we we're pushing this so hard, um, and hopefully we'll continue to see those numbers increase. Can you yeah. um, that's exactly right. And one of the things that we're looking at for next summer, and, and Project Red has expressed um, a strong interest in helping us do it, is to have a booth that Taste of Amherst. Um, it's over the summer once school gets up, and they said that they would be more than happy to help with our staff to go there and uh, introduce some of the menu items and see, you know, try to get the word out to people. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you. I think when we moved to this, I certainly said this might cost us a little more this first year, right? There's a lot of learning curve. There was a lot to do. There's a lot of things we hadn't done in over a decade. Um, and to see the numbers come out that not only did we get the student participation up and we got healthy meals to kids, which were our main goals, we actually did it for less money, which I think is absolutely amazing and beat my expectations of where we would be on this program. So I think that's a, just a huge shout out to everybody who was involved in that. Um, and I saw, um, you know, on my Facebook feed this summer, lots of people taking pictures of the signs that said, free lunch. <laughs> you know, under 18, come get a free mm -hmm. lunch, and, and people are really reacting to that. So, you know, to your point about promoting it, that's something when you see, you know, 
a lot of people recognizing the school providing lunches all over um, the community and other communities. It, it just was like, that's, I'm, I'm so glad we did that. Mm -hmm. Spitzer has the same demo. Well, I'm also really excited about this change at the school. So thank you for coming for this great presentation. Um, I have a couple questions, and I'm concerned about elementary schools in the in regional because the yeah we're not really not supposed to yeah the presentation had a lot of stuff about the, the elementary school um, so I'll try to I'll try to be precise if I'm asking something sure. that um, goes outside of the, the region let me know um, so I'm excited about the, the diversity of options I guess I um, I'm curious if there's a plan to try to increase some of the vegetarian options as a vegetarian family. Mm -hmm. That's the one thing that often keeps me from sending my kid into to eat. Um, there aren't as many options. And then I had a question about this. Um, it's great that we have a sustainability position. And I'm wondering how that intersects with things about um, uh, like the waste that's produced when we eat our lunches in terms of like I don't know if we're using plastic utensils or if we're using tray, you know, I'm just wondering if there's any movement on trying to reduce any of that waste. It sounds like the sustainability talk has been so far about kind of like growing our own food and not so much about what we produce um, in consuming it. So I had a question about that. And then um, I just think it's great that we're, we're trying to increase the meals and trying to get more kids to eat because I think meals it's a way we build community. I mean, I think coming around a table and sharing a meal is, is one really excellent way of, of getting to know people. So the more we can do that in our schools, I think that's really great. And then I just have one follow-up question when we saw the big spike in the number of meals provided um, over the summer. How much of that is we're meeting the demand that was there and how much is the demand increasing? Because I mean, to me, that's really good news that we're feeding more people, but it also causes me concern. Does this mean that we're, exp you know, we weren't meeting the, the demand. I mean, I, I guess I just am curious. Is it supply or is it demand or is it a little bit of both? And is there any way we, I'd be concerned that hunger is going up in our community yeah. and we should maybe be trying to do more to address it. I think it's, I mean, I'll, we'll go in reverse order. So I think it's mostly meeting the demand that was there. So okay. a lot of the spike is because we had new program. Are we programs that existed before that weren't being provided the free lunches? We now provide free lunches to those programs. So I'm not sure what they did before that yeah. to get lunch, if they just bring your own lunch, or um, if those individual programs did something. But um, most of that expansion was we did a search for all the programs that had our kids, and these were the ones we you know, tried to hit all the, the, the big ones, I mean, some of the small ones. So. Um, and then in terms of the uh, waste part, I think it's mostly school specific right now. I don't okay. think that, unless Jen wants to correct me, um, I think it's mostly school. So some schools, groups of kids get really um, excited about doing certain things. We do compost um, at some of the schools, but I don't think there's like a concerted effort, but that's something we can look into um, as we go forward. I can add one thing, Sean. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so right now, so I, I I love that Sean called me the sustainability I coordinator. <laughs> and he said it three times, so I'm going to maybe adopt it as one of my titles. I am I'm the science and garden coordinator, but whenever something comes into the district that's sustainability related, Mike's like, Jen loves that. And so um, I end up talking to a lot of folks about it. And we are working right now with um, uh, a student and a uh, uh, faculty member at UMass in the MS3 program, the Masters of Science in S Sustainability Science. Mm -hmm. um, to do um, basically like a case study report on seeing like what does it look like when districts attempt to go zero waste? Um, you know, what's the timeline? What are the challenges? What are the different stages along the way? Um, and so that is uh, the proposals written and that case study research is being done right now. So we're actively pursuing um, and actively interested in ways that the district can uh, green its practices and kind of come more into alignment with a greener philosophy. Can we flag that as something that when it's ready to be brought back to the committee, you guys bring it back to the committee and present and talk about it? Yeah, absolutely. That'd be awesome. Yeah. We are, uh, for most of the entrees that we do, we're always trying to find um, a vegetarian option. And uh, once we are able to do that, we label those on our menu. As much as possible, we try to include a vegetarian option in all of our menus daily. Yeah, I see that the, 
at the region level, that seems it's more common than common at the uh, elementary. So I'm glad to see that at the region level. It's great. Ms. Gassenson, Mr. Um, I Yes, I just had a couple of quick questions. I mean, sorry, I had a quick response, um, partly to some of Mr. Menino's comments. Um, what I think important thing to remember is that we're not trying to, we're not making a profit on this. So we can provide a really good meal, um, I think, affordably. When we have strong and creative leadership working with a lot of invested um, stakeholders in the community, we can do a lot to provide quality and affordable food. So, um, I mean, from what I've heard, my ki I know personally my kids are a lot really excited, a lot more excited about the school lunches this year. They've been real happy. So I think there's a lot to be really positive about. And um, I was going to ask if there's time when school committee members can come and try the school lunch sometime. Steve <laughs> comes all the time. We have, um, <laughs> and what we're, we, we have um, school, school lunch week that's coming up in October. That would be a good time to have the committee members come in and sit and eat. And once we, uh, we roll out the breakfast in the classroom, we would also like some stakeholders to come and participate in that breakfast in the classroom. It's always good to show that you are eating or parents and, and other stakeholders are participating. And I always encourage my teachers to purchase from the cafeteria. And, uh, <laughs> well, we sometimes do breakfast for dinner as a treat, so I say breakfast at the committee meeting. <laughs> <laughs> what we should be doing. Um, yeah, so I, I, uh, the points I wanted to bring up, um, Ms. Kosensky actually brought up both of them. Um, I think you kind of buried the lead in this presentation. A smaller deficit and increased participation. It's not uh, all about the numbers. <laughs> well, I, I, I know that. It's about the I know that, but um, you know, there was a lot of thought, and, and, and I think there was a lot of acceptance that, okay, we're going to take a hit. And if that happens, that's okay because it's an investment. So it, it just, again, speaks to, to the leadership and, uh, and all, all the hard work, I'm sure, of all the, all the staff. So it's, it's great. Um, yeah, in, in terms of like um, communicating this uh, to the community, man, the free summer lunches, that, that was the easiest thing to share in social media. Uh, it, you know, as soon as I like share that, it's like 10 people like this, this, this. People get so excited about it because you know, most people don't really know what, what the opportunity yeah. is. And they're like, are you serious? You could just show up and you don't have to show ID or prove anything. You just get, get a free lunch. And people feel so good about sharing that. And, so when I think about, you know, what are the things that people feel like such a sense of pride in? Because the, the town does invest a lot in the schools, and so we want to show them, you know, that it's reflective of our community values. That's like really near the top of the list. So, you know, whatever touch points you have with people in Central Ops that are working on communications, promotions, um, you know, it's got to be yeah. right near the top. Um, and, you know, similar thing for the locally sourced farm to school. People are really excited about that. Um, you know, obviously, if there's anything the com committee can do to support, you know, possibly getting that six-figure grant, you know, please come and, and talk to us about that. And the breakfast in the classroom is, is another amazing thing that, if I just mention the possibility that we're piloting it, uh, you know, sparks three or four different conversations. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, there's just a lot of community value and support of it. So I, I'm, I wasn't here when we had the initial vote to, to move the uh, food services in-house, but I'm so glad that we did. <laughs> and it's so great that we have such creative, engaged leadership in, in this kind of position. It's, it's kind of an uncommon thing in, from districts I've spoken to to it, have it be such an elevated, important role, and, and it's it's so great in our community. So thank you for all of your work. So, um, oh, I'm I'm going to speak after you get a chance to speak. All right. Um, <clears throat> uh, one of the main concerns I had um, was with the breakfast in the classroom program. Actually, uh, looking at you are trying to roll it out in the middle and high school as well. Yes. The Midland High School, yes, at oh, some yeah. point. Um, but so with that, um, there are just like a few obstacles I noticed, one of which is that in certain uh, classrooms and subjects, uh, food isn't allowed in the classroom for uh, you know, sanitary reasons or what have you. And so giving that option but not having it be an option to all because maybe their first class is like a science or an art class. Um, another thing is just that. Uh, the food in the classroom in general is uh, a thing that is up to the teacher's discretion. And so having this service, while it looks like a great idea and I'm in full support of it, I worry about uh, that like relationship between food services and then the discretion of the teachers once the students get into the classroom with food. So the, the 
for the Midland High School, the breakfast model that would best work, and that's something that we have to look into, is breakfast after the instructional period doesn't necessarily mean breakfast in the classroom. We have the grab and go and other um, models that we, we can do. But for, for, for when we do, if we do have breakfast in the classroom, there are always, um, we have to work with facilities to make sure that it's sanitary, we have to make sure that waste are disposed of properly. So it's always something that we have to meet with all the stakeholders, the teachers, facilities, and students, and make sure that we are all working together because we can see the benefits of having breakfast in the classroom. One thing that I notice and is prominent is, and, and teachers will say that, and if you <coughs> visit any, any, any schools with those kinds of model, is that when students come in and there's um, food available or breakfast available, it calms them, it gets the instructional day started right. It also limits the number of time kids will leave the classroom and need to go visit the nurse or so on. So that's something that once we show them the research, show the teachers the research and, and, and um, have put all the, the, the things in place through facilities, the staff, food service staff, and, and, and have a plan of how we'll do that, I think everyone will buy into it after they see the, the benefits of it. Uh, so anything, anything, um, I'd go back to something that's been said a couple times. Uh, I think it's wonderful. First off, by the way, this is all wonderful. I should just, I, I, I hate the whole business of repeating what everyone else has said. <laughs> but this is an awesome presentation. The work has been really tremendous over the past year. It's obviously years getting off to a great start. Um, this is everything we were looking for. And, and the key thing is to keep at it. And, to, and so I think one thing that the committee is clearly excited about doing is in our role if there's anything we can be doing to help support the program so i think as we've said there's a strong interest in breakfast uh, after the bell or whatever in the classroom uh anything i think we could do to be supportive including i think on a marginal level budgetarily if that's needed i don't know if it is needed um that's the kind of thing we want to i think know and have it come forward i think if there's any, i think i, I this is certainly true if there's anything we can do for the grant we should be supportive but i also think in Finding creative ways to increase the visibility of the program, of the foods, of local farmers and producers who are engaging, um, who are able to do innovative things around composting and waste reduction. I think that whole picture, holistically, um, including also, you talked about the diversity of the staff, professional development of the staff. Um, you know, we tend to talk, I, mean, I don't mean this in a funny way, but I mean, we tend to talk sometimes about staff as they're sort of like, objects of discussion as opposed to people who are in fact leaders in their work and I think it's a wonderful thing to do to get a chance to do that as well um, especially because I think the chef stem work which which I've heard positive things about only really succeeds if then the recipes are adopted inculcated and involved in the daily menu right and so I think finding a way for us to be engaged in celebrating that work and giving greater visibility to it would be a really neat thing. There's a lot of things that probably wouldn't involve us, but I'm just saying if there's anything we can do to be helpful in that, um, I think we would encourage it. And one of the things I'm excited about looking at in the coming year is where we can, um, first off, what you continue to hear from students, because that's something incredibly important. And just knowing that there's a continual feedback mechanism of hearing from students about what they like, what they don't like, and what can be improved. Same thing from staff, but also uh, looking at the diversity of menu items and sort of the richness in terms of vegetarian, local, but also just different cultures being touched on upon in terms of their food. Uh, it may sound dumb, but when I saw tofu stir fry on there, I, I was like personally kind of excited to see <laughs> tofu on, and it's, it's more cultural than it is vegetarian for me, but it was neat. And it's like, see, so look at it, and you're like chicken biryani and you know, teriyaki stir fry with tofu and, you know, uh, tacos al pastor. We I have mean, a Jamaican jerk coming up. Jamaican jerk coming up. <laughs> I mean, but I think any, that but, but that's actually the kind of stuff I was interested in hearing. Yes. It's because to me that's just, it's, it's incredibly exciting. I'm hoping that as students are, I hope students like that. Yeah. It's a lot of stuff. We have to 
And we are working with Chef Sam just to also um, do training for the cooks to make sure that these menus are, uh, these items are, these recipes are, are included in the menu and it's done um, the right way because it doesn't make sense we have this fancy recipe that's not getting the simple methods um, across and have it done properly. Yeah, I mean, this is something I already, already know we've heard tonight, but I, I, I think I came on the committee when the, the working group that um, Mr. Mangana was, was working on was, was coming into a landing on some of its work and starting to present its initial results. This has to be one of the topics of greatest enthusiasm, <coughs> greatest care, and greatest concern that I can even think of. Mm -hmm. And it's one that has also the, the capability, of, unlike most of the other things we talk about, we care deeply about, of instead of being like joyless and sort of semi-negative, um, to actually being utterly joyful in, in what we're really doing and what the end result is um, for kids and for the staff and for our community. And so it's just, you know, we want you, I mean, we wanted this presentation in like March. And we wanted it, think, wait. We wanted it in July. And we, we, we waited until September and we we're excited. I mean, sir, I just, I'm saying this only because I don't mean it's in a, I mean it's in is affirmative and as affirming a way as I can, like we're all, like like every day we're right behind you. Okay. And we know so many members of the community are too. Mr. Renan. I want to make clear my original comment was only to support you. You're doing a remarkable job <laughs> within the existing constraints. But why does it have to be a self-sustaining program? Why That's do we not. want to eliminate that deficit? We don't... Uh, take low enrollment classes and say if they, they don't pay their way and don't offer low enrollment classes, why does lunch have to support itself? You can keep the $3, but increase the general funding. Mr. Sullivan. Just a suggestion. No, no, I, Mr. Sullivan. I just want to um, thank Mr. Mangano, Mr. Harp, and so, I'm sorry, Kasha. I, don't, I don't remember your last name. Palmer. For the hard work you've done, especially on the, the summer programs where you've increased it to 10 mm -hmm. sites. And I just want to say, I think we missed an opportunity this summer to get the word out because when I saw the article about the baby bird truck serving teenagers, which was excellent, and it was moving around, I was yelling at the article, you know, having been part of the visioning no, I group. The same thing. I was yelling, I was <laughs> like, what about the schools? I know, it's like... We were serving 10, 10 different locations, and yeah. I think we missed that. Yeah. But we did work somewhat in partnership with UMass. Um, there was communication between UMass and the schools. But, but I'm, right, I'm just talking about an article. An article would have been, we should have, yeah. next year. So how do you like Thank the food? you. How do you like the food? Oh, it's super. <laughs> and I, I believe that as the program can use to roll out, that as more middle schoolers are introduced to that food by the time they do get to the high school, they'll continue to mm. eat the school food instead of bringing their lunches. That's, fa that's fascinating. Over the summer when I was talking to Mr. Mangano and Mr. Harm, one of, I, we were, they were hypothesizing around these trends, and they said, by the time you get to high school, I remember you guys said this, by the time you get, you get in, you're already in your junior or senior year, you're sort of locked into a pattern of how you're eating. And I remember you both said you were hoping, what you said? So hope we hope you're all three right. <laughs> Is there anything further? I mean, so we want to let you go and then move on with our agenda. We will do that. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And as we said, on, this, on, to, on to more cheerful topics. The, the FY18 fourth quarter budget update. That that that's um, miss. I'm teasing you slightly, Sean. But misleadingly, in every category, it says, "Oh my goodness, funding so under under budget and projection. Isn't this amazing?" Until you get to the end, and it's like, "Oh yeah, that's right." And then there's a six hundred forty-eight thousand dollar overrun in healthcare and benefits. Yep. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Everything adds up to zero. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm sorry. I gave away the headline. I'm sorry, Sean. <laughs> So the, alert now. <laughs> I to leave, so. Uh, so the budget actually um, ended pretty well considering what we dealt with last year, um, despite the, the large increase in health insurance. Um, really, the thing that saved us is the out-of-district tuitions and, and the students, you know, fewer students going out and some students coming back really saved the region last year. 
Um, we're giving an hour, I probably won't spend, I won't read it unless somebody wants me to. I'm going to focus mainly on the pictures and the charts and the graphs because those, I think, are mm -hmm. informative. Um, That's what my mind can handle it. Yeah, so I, I will read the headline. So at the close of the fiscal year um, 18, uh, the Amherst Common Regional School District budget ended 2.16% under budget um, due to savings in payroll and tuition. So that's sort of the main takeaway. But go to the second page. So one area that we just we need to keep um, some closer tabs on, I think, moving forward is our substitute costs. You can see those have generally been growing over um, the past few years. It's also one of those things that is sort of impacted by um, minimum wage increases going up because we try to keep our uh, sub rates at least equal to minimum wage, if not higher. Um, so during the budget season, it's something we may see an adjustment being made to, um, to reflect our actual cost. It's not really a discretionary thing. It's as needed mm -hmm. uh, for the subs. Um, on the next page, you'll also see another sort of um, negative trend is our contracted special ed transportation costs. So those have grown um, from about 50,000 in FY12 to about 270,000 in FY18. You um, may remember signing up uh, Voting a three year contract with Vanpool, which was designed to help get those costs down a little bit, and they will. Um, but we are having more kids go to district that require transportation, um, and some, some of them are going farther away, so the transportation costs are pretty significant. Um, so that's another trend that we're going to keep track of as we go forward. One of the uh, unfortunate things is we don't get circuit breaker reimbursement for spe uh, special ed transportation, which is a huge cost of a special ed program for a student, but we don't get any reimbursement for it. Regional transportation reimbursement and circuit breaker reimbursement for those costs. Um, the good news is the chart right below it, so it's sort of broken into three phases here. So the first one is vocational uh, tuition out of district. So the first bar is what we have for FY17 actual students going out of the district. And the next is what we budgeted for FY18 based on that actual. And then the third is what we actually had in FY18. Um, so you can see our vocational enrollment went down quite a bit from what we had in FY17 and what we budgeted for FY18. Um, same thing for charter. You can see our actual charter enrollment went down from FY17 actual, and it reversed the trend of many years going up, like 10 to 12 kids at, uh, at a time. And our FY17 choice out of district went down as well. So across the board, all sort of the uh, non-special ed out of tuition programs, we saw students, uh, we saw the levels stay flat or go down. Uh, the next chart just shows you the actual numbers behind those. Um, I won't harp on the lunch participation one because we just had a mm -hmm. whole presentation on lunch participation. Um, and then the last thing, so our revenues, our revenues came in a little bit under budget, meaning we thought we were get more revenue. The main reason that they came in under though was due to the charter tuition coming in under. So our charter tuition revenues are based on our out of district charter costs. And if out of district charter comes in a little bit budget, then our revenues come in less too. Um, so it's, it's a, revenue deficit, but it's sort of a good one because our expenses came in so much lower. Um, so the net, basically, of um, the revenues and the expenses and what we are sort of uh, putting back into e and at the end of the year is 569628 and what we voted to use from e and to support the FY19 budget is 500000 So sort of the measure of are we in an okay place is are we putting more back in than what we're using to support the next year's budget? In this case, we're putting uh, $69,000 more back in. So that's sort of the, the highlights of the FY18 Q4 budget update. I'm happy to answer any questions or revisit any topics that I may have skipped over. Ms. Kremlin? Uh, first of all, excellent job of setting all your y axes mm -hmm. to, to zero. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I still um, remember that from town meeting, too. <laughs> <laughs> right. um, so, one, one short question, then we made one more general one. Um, maybe I'm just not reading it right, and I, I probably should given the number of presentations you've done on this, but. So the 569 that's left over at the end, how does that relate to the first number mm -hmm. of 940, of 950, essentially? I'm yeah. basically trying to understand yeah, yeah, yeah. how they all connect. Well, big picture, like, oh, what did we save? And then of what we saved, where is it going? So if you go to the first page of 949, we don't really, um, so that's after you take out 280. If you look right above that number, you see the 280. Mm -hmm. So that 280 is um, a contingency, basically, that the school committee votes every year. We never touch it. So it comes out of B&D, we have it in the budget just in case there's an emergency, and then we don't use it and it goes back into B&D. Mm -hmm. So ignore that number and look at the one right above it, which is the 669. That's really what we came in under budget from operations for the year. And so we came in under budget by 669, but our revenues were short by 100 and 100,000. Oh, okay. okay. So the, the sum of those two numbers is the 569 and what goes back into B&D. 
Do we ever use the, that emergency? How often is that, is that occurring um, that we don't use the emergency? We haven't used it since I've been here. Um, and the main reason we don't use this is because if you use it, then it's basically taken directly from Andy because we're not putting it back in right. at the end of the year. But um, it's, we haven't used it. We almost used it when we had the gym issue, the flood, but we were able to figure it out during the year without tapping into that. So, mm -hmm. um, But basically, it's just 280 coming straight out of the ND that if we didn't have it there and there was an emergency, we'd have to revisit the whole budget, mm -hmm. essentially, and have it revoted. Mm -hmm. so. Can I follow something on that? Is that yeah. since you said we voted to take 500000 out of E&D for this fiscal year yep. to use, yep. and we ended up putting in five, we're going to make a whole ourselves, put it in 569 yep. in D&D, &D, which means there's a net plus of 69. What that essentially means is the savings um, that were sort of enforced last year because we knew we were in bad times yep. um, have managed to catch us up to the point that some of the more challenging things we had to do for this year, like taking a half million out of E and D, we're we're essentially able to net out and make make ourselves whole for that decision. At least for FY eighteen. Um, well, I don't mean forever. I just mean yeah, yeah. Right. I mean, um, I mean, the main reason we were able to come out to do it for FY eighteen is because we did restrict the budget um, yeah. about halfway through the year because we didn't know where the health insurance premiums were going to end up. Um, so the tuitions with the restricted budget. Um, some staff turnover savings ended up putting us in a good place. And we wanted to come in with at least what we were using for FY19. Um, so I think the answer to what you're saying is yes. Well, the reason I'm saying that just is because a, a reasonable person could sit back and say, last year we ended up having to make a lot of emergency decisions mm -hmm. to cut back spending that was unpalatable and undesirable. Um, we also had to make cuts for this coming fiscal year. Um, you send, then see a half million dollars sitting around and a reasonable person could say, wouldn't it be great to have spent it? Mm -hmm. And you could make that case, it's perfectly fine to make that case. But an alternative case to be made would be that um, since we don't know what could possibly pop up this year that would put our budget at risk, we've at least put ourselves on a better or more even keel. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and again, so for, say few, for immediate future challenges. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, if we, and if we did spend it and we still took the 500000 out for the FY19 budget, then our, our E&D fund just goes down by 500000 and that's essentially half of our E&D fund. And so the, what we pull out of E&D every year, it's not necessarily recurring revenue, right? It's basically if we have money left over the year before um, is what we're applying to the next year's budget. So that's why we're always careful that whatever we vote for FY19 the, the following year, if we want to put back at the end of this year, because if not, we're basically just spending on reserves. Um, if you're able to. Yeah. But if it hadn't been there, then we wouldn't have been able to. And we just, I mean, we knew when we were taking the vote this past spring that if, if it was a lousy enough budget to have to vote, that if we were having to cut the margins of E&D a little bit, we were just doing that. Yeah. I mean, I'm not saying it wouldn't have put yeah. anything back, but it, instead of being 569, it could have been 369. Yeah, to some extent. But also when we um, present the budget, mm -hmm. you know, we have to make an assumption over what E&D number we use mm -hmm. to meet the budget, and essentially that could lead to more cuts or less cuts. So when we set that number, we look at what we think we're going to end up right. at at the end of the year. So the 500,000 is sort of the ballpark that we thought we might end up at, um, although there was a lot of uncertainty last year with the health Insurance. We talked about, I mean, sorry to believe this, I apologize. There's no microphone, I'm grabbing the microphone. <laughs> but I mean, but I mean, we literally talked about this mm -hmm. at the end of the budget type. Like, well, what's the level of uncertainty mm -hmm. in the numbers coming in worse than they were? Yeah. And what you're reporting is that they came in fine relative yeah. to those yeah, expectations. Because yeah, of tuition. Too. Yeah. Sorry to belabor it, but since no, it's good we all went through hell basically last year with the budget, it's not an unimportant topic. Yeah. Anything else? Sheldon? So any early signs that health insurance is going to blow everything up again? Um, so we're in the Maya trust now. So the good news is that um, we know our rates for this year. They're not going to change um, unless there's something that happens that's never happened in Maya's history, uh, which is the rates changing during the year. So for this year, we're set. Um, for next year, um, we know our increase is going to be no worse than the average increase in Maya. So when they do the increases, they they have a low, a, a medium, and a high, basically, and they band communities together based on their experience. And so we're going to be no worse than the average. This is one of the promises they made to the, the group when we signed up with them. Um, so past history is that's like around 4 or 5% poten uh, potentially, which is much better than what we had the prior year. Um, so really the unknown around health insurance this year is enrollment. 
I mean, we'll get firm numbers on that um, next month. October is when all the new hire new employees go on and the old uh, retirees go off. Um, so I'll have an update for the first quarter budget. But we have seen, a, which is sort of good and bad, we've seen a, a pretty large increase in opt-outs, which, you know, it's unfortunate that people are choosing to go to other insurance because it's either better or the cost was too high here. But um, financially for the district, every time there's an opt-out, we save about depending if it's a family plan or a single plan, somewhere between like three to four thousand to as much as thirteen thousand um, per opt out. Um, so we saw, we've seen the opt out numbers go up. Thank you. Anything else? Question. Yeah. So um, because we put a freeze on um, expenses last year to try to mitigate some of our issues, um, what was the impact of that? And our, our budget this year is even tighter, so if we put off buying things that we really needed, it's not really in the budget this year. How is that kind of lining up for things that our school is needing? There's a lot of early spending, I think, as a result of that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think as soon as the budget turned over, they'll let's get our purchases in before <laughs> something happens. So um, I think the major impact is that we're going to see a lot more earlier spending this year um, as a result. It, I think up through the last six months where things were restricted. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't that there was no spending. No, but, just uh, critical things yeah. were purchased, yeah, but exactly. a lot of the nice to haves or things that could be put yeah. off were put off. Yeah. Um, I just had a follow up question on this. Um, you mentioned the subsidy costs were yeah. one area of concern. Um, so I'm sure part of it is um, the total, the wages going up. Yeah. Another piece is. Um, leaves of absences. So I guess I'm just curious, like, is that anything that we have control over or the district has control over? Or is that something that, I, I guess just if we were to address this, what would mm -hmm. be your recommendations or what should we know about yeah. the, the, the people and the factors behind these yeah, changes? Yeah, most of these costs, so we sort of have two sub-buckets. This sub-bucket is um, sick, personal time, primarily. Okay. Um, so that in terms of approved, it's really things that are not up for approval essentially it's um we have some there's a lot of spikes here and there because if there's a, a lot of long-term leaves that year for medical reasons and the sub costs are higher that year um, we have a separate bucket which is a much smaller bucket for like professional development leaves subs for those for professional development leaves um, that we have more control over really to the budget piece of how much we want to set that at um, but this bucket which we're seeing the trend is more just you know, more sickness in general or um, long, more long-term leaves um, due to medical things during the year <laughs> yeah. Except budget, yeah. right? Um, or wellness programs, and I mean, yeah, some yeah. of the medical. Eat the healthy school related. lunch. Eat the Let's healthy see. school lunch. I was just on that comment because I think it is kind of interesting. Uh, wellness programs. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think you know that there was definitely research coming back about the investment that is made by employers around the country in all sorts mm -hmm. of different sectors. Um, to help employees feel better, you know, and, and just get over illness more quickly, take better care of themselves, all those kinds of things, which of course benefits their morale and benefits their health, which is a, a plus for everyone, including the students, and then also has the added benefit of, you know, our bottom line. Um, so maybe something to think about and, you know, and, and just explore in the year coming up, because I, I do remember during the negotiations us talking a little bit about some of the substitutes, uh, you know, sort of costs related to this. Um, and, you know, I, to me, this doesn't, it doesn't feel alarming. It's not like we're seeing this gigantic spike, but we're definitely seeing a trend, yeah. you know, that seems to be moving up. So maybe there's something there that we can address to help our employees feel better and, you know, cut some of these costs. And Maya, um, the presentations I've been at, Maya has a pretty good wellness program. Um, I'm getting a survey right now that if I fill out twice a month, I get like a twenty dollars gift card. It's like a healthy survey, like you know, like even this is bad for your health or something. Um, so they have a lot of little things like that and discounts for the healthy buying. Um, uh, so, so they have a pretty good wellness program. So I think they know that they, they for them it saves them money too, right? Mm -hmm. Family members aren't getting sick and using health insurance, and it saves them a lot of money. So. Um, so I think that's something we'll look into more on how to communicate the wellness program to employees. Yeah. Well, yep. just to follow up on that, I think, you know, uh, in California, where I lived for a while, you know, Kaiser Permanente has this mm -hmm. enormous program yep. with all of their staff, uh, but also their members. And, and you know, the, the, the focus really is on reducing costs and improving, you know, people's overall health. Um, and so there's, you know, a lot of really great models to, to, you know, whether it's Maya or others that we could potentially be using to help us do that. 
Thank you. And I think we've lost our computer AV capabilities. I don't know if you, you don't need it, right? I, I don't need it for this one. Okay, that's all right. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Charter ex school expansion request discussion. It seems perennial, like whack a mole. Yeah. Uh, but uh, we're at it again, so it means we got to get active again. Mm -hmm. Yes, so the broken record item that, that never never ends. So, uh, uh, as you all know, once again, the Charter School in Hadley is proposing to expand. Um, it, and the same process as last year, if you weren't here um, last year for it, basically the commissioner accepts input up to a certain date. Uh, the published date is going to be. The deadline is no earlier than November 1st. We, we uh, the superintendent mentioned a couple of days ago that he expects that date to hold. So it should be November 1st, where the committee can send letters, the public can send emails to charter schools at doe.mass.edu, which is available uh, in other places. Um, commissioner makes a decision. If it's approved, uh, it goes to the board for a final vote. Um, if it's approved, then we would want to uh, Ask the board to overturn that that ruling, which has happened in the past. Uh, and if it's if the commissioner does not approve, uh, the school is very likely to appeal, which it has done the last couple of years. And then we go to the board and make the case again. So um, I, th I think our path, our standard path, is pretty straightforward in terms of we should write the same a letter last year, which I think should be fairly similar to last year. It's essentially updating the data because the arguments haven't really changed because the proposal hasn't really changed. Um, Except to say that, and you know, we all got this very long document of the proposal to say that the way that it's characterized this year is, is particularly, um, I don't know what the word is for it, so I'll just read a couple of sentences off the, uh, the first page here. It says, the PVCICS Board of Trustees wishes to make this change, the expansion, to satisfy unmet demand for kindergarten seats, expand opportunity and choice for urban, suburban, and rural, rural students to attend desegregated integrated public schools and increase the integration of staffing in public education. PVCICS has proven to be an engine of integration in Hampshire County. So, you know, when I read that, I was like, oh, well, I should go and look at the updated data because they're, uh, they're doing this constant accusation against our board and other boards that we are producing an opposition mythology, that we are somehow misconstruing what, is, what, is the, what the data is. So um, the Department of Ed has their own uh, enrollment numbers for for all sorts of different groups, and it looks at all the high need achievement gap subgroups of low income, Hispanic, et cetera. Um, and so when you look at all of these groups and you compare the school's enrollment to the uh, region of towns that it serves, they are woefully under-enrolled in, in nearly every one of these categories. Um, you know, just one example, the, their service region is 35% Hispanic, they're 5.5%. The uh, service region is 20% special ed, uh, they're at 5.9 percent. In fact, if you if you look at all 197 individual schools in the 31 towns, they're 196th in percent of special ed students. It just it's it's uh, you can't um, state the point. Anymore. Same thing with low income, high needs, um, ELL. Um, so um, so why do I bring that up? I, I bring that up because. Um, to sort of relate it to one of our earlier agenda items that um, our uh, the MTA uh, president was, was bringing up, um, you know this th this is this is an attack on public schools. It's 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 completely erroneous, juxtaposed with the data the Department of Ed um, provides, and it's something that's worth uh, I think pushing strongly against um, back. And and in the in this year in which a lot of different towns are going to be coming together to advocate for state funding of education. Certainly the charter drain is a big part of that. And so um, I've, al I've already heard from other towns and we've seen some things in the, in the media of people pretty angry at not just the repeated request, but the, the nature of the accusation. Um, and so, yes, we should do our letter, um, but I think we should sort of keep our eyes out this month because it's going to be a fairly contracted time period and it's 11-1 is the deadline, uh, for opportunities to, to stand together with other schools and, and the MTA and, and other groups that are advocating on this issue. So um, I, th I think our next step is probably to draft a letter and uh, at our October meeting uh, review it. Vote on it, sir. Yeah, vote on it. That'll be our only opportunity. So we have to yeah. review and vote. So we'll have to get the draft in advance of it. I think the other thing is because this is a regional committee meeting, 
the representatives here of all the individual elementary committees and town committees. And I think what we what we'd love to see is for you to go back to your regular town committee. And if you had, weren't, or I mean, you were maybe already be doing this. And if you are, then this meeting would people be saying that awesome. They're so happy mm -hmm. to know that. Uh, and if you haven't gotten around to it yet, knowing this. Um, November 1st deadline, then syncing up your calendar to try to take a look at providing a letter of your own on the subject would be really, really critical because the, the, the classic mistake here could be it turns out your committee meeting just happens to meet at a time that makes it inconvenient to draft and approve a letter. And so now's, now's the time to look. And then I think beyond that, one of the things that we'd love to see is if, if um, we can reach out to our local school committees and finance committees as well to possibly also provide some formal support from each of our towns. I think beyond that, um, by the way, I apologize. We talked about this on Tuesday at an Amherst School Committee meeting. So if it sounds like what I'm saying sounds even more declarative, it's because we were part of a longer other discussion and I forgive the regional members for the fact that I'm doing that. But um, one of the other thing too is the extent that I think if we take accountability for our own local committees, select like boards and finance committees, that's extremely helpful. And then I assume, I assume Mr. Demling and Ms. Adonias are going to keep at um, outreach to other committees in the area. Uh, and if you need any I'm help. I'm seeing four thumbs up. No, no, no. <laughs> if you need any help, we'll, I can help. We can help. Mm -hmm. but, it, but I'm assuming you're, you were doing that before, so I'm continue, we're continuing to do that. Um, anyways. So that's where we're at on that. It's it is a, and actually it's funny because we we're talking about this on Tuesday, and this approval will come after the gubernatorial re-election, mm -hmm. which, re, to be blunt, re, I think the point of the board turning over is a good one. That was made by Mr. Demling in a previous meeting, mm -hmm. um, but I think the fact that this is coming after the gubernatorial election <coughs> makes it even more pointed mm -hmm. because I could you could imagine putting a lens on decision-making around public and community opinion that could be potentially different after November 6th than it is before November 6th. I don't know if that's true or not, but I don't want to, I don't want to take that chance at all. So, cool. Anything else on this? Just, yes. Just Let's one see. note. I don't know if it's valuable to add to your letter, but I thought that um, the other noted difference when I read their application was that this time not only are they maybe asking for approval to expand, but that, um, well, if not, you need to give us a number of students yes. for which you are willing to let us expand right. to, um, which I don't think is the job of that board. No. And so you might, uh, that would just be another. Sure. Yeah, the other thing that makes makes crafting the tone somewhat challenging, and uh, I remember Ms. Nakajima bringing up this point, is that you know, part of it is kind of reminding the board of Ed, of Ed what they've said in the past. Yeah. And so it's, and, and, and in one sense, it seems a little bit browbeating to do that. On the other sense, you know, they have, Commissioner of Ed has a billion things that he's paying attention to. He's like, what is it, you know, charter school? And so he's relying on the charter school office that relies on there. And so we sort of have to say, well, we've been paying attention to the history. Copy, paste, copy, paste. Here's what you've told them to do the last two years. You told them to go away. For two to three years, and they haven't. I, I mean, tonally, <laughs> ton, the funny part is tonally is just, I mean, I'll be better be phrasing it, it's just not being snarky about it. Right. <laughs> it's sort of just being like matter, matter of fact. fact right. Like, we've been reviewing your responses, and we noted, because we did the same, anyways, whatever. Good. Okay, we have our to-do list. Um, accept the gifts. I think we have gifts. We have gifts. We have yeah. many yes. gifts. Um, this is going to be a chore. Volunteers? Happy chore. Of course it's happy chore. Tremendous. Uh, so I move to accept the gifts to the Amherst Regional School Committee um, as follows. Uh, Valley Gift Community Foundation of Western Massachusetts, check number 2278524 to support the athletic program in the total of $2,456.31. Uh, check from Margaret Lafter and Margot Mace, check number 11664, in memory of Philip Mitchell Ted Madden Scholarship, in the amount of $20. Uh, uh, donor Pamela Moser, check number 2193, in memory of Philip Mitchell Ted Madden Scholarship, $25. Uh, 
donor Terry Ray and Margo of Margo Mace, uh, number 13557, in memory of Philip Mitchell Ted Madden Scholarship in the amount of $100. Donor Thomas Leffler, Jr., check number 1800, in memory of Philip Mitchell Ted Madden Scholarship in the amount of $50. Donor Class of 2018, check number 6409, to support the Class of 2018 for Class of 2019 scholarship in the amount of $500. Donor James, Marjorie, Michael, and Christopher Abel for, to support lacrosse fees for in-need students in memory of Judy Brooks in the amount of $250. Donor Dror, Shirley Schmerling, and the check number is 3285 to support the Ames program in the amount of $500. Donor Patricia Bodie and Mark Moriarty, and the check is 77929, in memory of Ryan at Amherst Regional High School Art and Library split, $3,000 each, in a total amount of $6,000. Donor Amherst Education Foundation, check number 1529, to support the Amherst Regional High School Light Board Performing Arts, in the amount of $3,347.50. Donor Amherst Education Foundation, check number 1529, to support the Amherst Regional High School Restorative Justice Team to improve relationships in the amount of $5,000. Donor Amherst Education Foundation, check number 1529, to support coding robotics course for all 8th grade students in the amount of $4,000. Donor Society for Science and the Public, check number 110559, to support 2018 Regeneron Science Award OMAX microscope purchase in the amount of $2,000. And donor the William Penn Foundation, check number 45141, to support Girls Ultimate Team donation May 30th, 2018, $250, two to one matching gift in the total amount of $500 for a total of $24,748.81. Is there a second? I'll second. Moved and seconded. <laughs> well, she did all the work. I mean, you know, at least we can do a second. It. Uh, they were odd. <laughs> is there is there any discussion? I mean, this is obviously amazing. Well spoken, Mr. Dillon. I yeah, I meant the yeah, gifts, but her, she was great too. Uh, no, sorry. Anything else? Seeing none. All those in favor of the motion is red. See where's your signal? Aye. Carries unanimously. Um, thank you very much. That really is remarkable, by the way. Remarkable. I don't remember a list this long last year. So this is really something else. Um, the, the last item we have is school committee planning upcoming topics. And unfortunately, I don't think we have the list of upcoming topics that. Can we just take an action to email out the list to the regional group and then we can. Yeah, why don't we do that and then why don't you. Why don't you yes? I was kind of, I was getting, I was reading the room that people would like to get that email to them and then they would like to respond if they wanted to add something and then they would like to go home. I mean, I'm not trying to stop anyone, <laughs> anyone. Yes, Mr. Donnelly. Yeah, just to add the um, charter letter and uh, um, if the committee would like a recreational pot um, for next meeting. Yeah, okay. Okay, great. Uh, is there a motion to adjourn? Yeah, is there a second? I'll second. All those in favor? It carries unanimously. We are adjourned. And, uh, Thank you. Good evening.